good evening <clears throat> to all of you uh, first of all thank you very much uh, all the viewers uh, who have joined us for this great evening of calcium master class which is the pinnacle of coronary intervention and at the same time i also take this opportunity to uh, welcome speakers from international and the national and our national uh, leaders joining in um, from all part of the country and all part of the world it's a great great privilege to have and i think i'll start with the reminiscences of the first calcium master class which we have uh, a few months uh, back which was a great and a grand success and but before that i go and talk about that calcium master class let me talk a little bit on what translumina as a company we stand for today we are very proud to inform you that we have a global presence and we see that today we are part of more than 50 countries with 1 million implants uh, having and what is very privileged to have it that, that we are today a company with the makers of the world longest study drug eluting stent and just to give you a brief uh, understand um, uh, view on this that whether it is a polymer or a non polymer strategy in both the uh, category today we have a stents which is having the world's um, basically the largest 10 years of clinical data and having built on this strength we are very soon coming with isar summit which will be a polymer free ever Volumous eluting stent, which is going to be the first time in the world, perhaps, which is not basically an iteration in the field of stent technology, but this could be a judge as one of those evolution which happened and can be called as a final frontier when it comes to stent uh, technology. And your love and affection today has uh, culminated in basically in forms of awards and accolades, which Translumina is being known for. And this is basically a, a, a token of love and affection of all of all of you. And just to give you that highlight, which I was just, just talking to you, that the first edition was basically a, a, an edition which happened in September. And the highlights was that we had three case in box presentation over more than 1500 digital footfalls. And this was basically a lot of issues were discussed and debated with the presence of renowned international and national uh, cardiologists. And what we, we were trying to do as the world is opening up, we thought that why not create a very boutique model of the same calcium masterclass, uh, curtailing it from two days to one day and making it from three hours to two hours. And in order to conduct this, today we have the galaxy of uh, speakers and experts, experts coming in today, perhaps getting them all at uh, face to face. And I was just talking to Dr. Stewart, who would have been very, very difficult to have it. But thanks to this virtual technology, which has made it possible to have all of us mm, here together to speak on this such a great platform on uh, basically on IVL, which is a grand second edition of calcium masterclass agenda consisting of all national and international speakers and in order to take this evening forward i have a great great privilege to have dr sarita rao ma'am who is now here and and let me have the opportunity to introduce dr sarita rao ma'am who needs no formal introduction informal introduction but let me introduce her as one of those renowned intervention cardiologists who had been responsible for establishing Department of Intervention Cardiology in uh, at Indore at, as an Apollo Rajeshri Hospital. Someone who has been associated as a first woman, as a first, many things as a first, as an intervention cardiologist who did an RDN procedures in entire region of Chhattisgarh and entire in, in, in the subcontinent region. First woman to adopt TAVR in therapy in MP region first woman to do an IVC TAVI case and the first woman to perform IVL case in Madhya Pradesh. And we are, and she's one who's associated with presenting multiple cases and research papers on various and international journal. Very privileged to have her. And with this, I would hand over um, this evening proceedings to Dr. Sarita Rao to introduce the entire faculty of the evening and take this proceedings and navigate to its great conclusion today evening. To over to you, Sarita Rao, ma'am. And I will uh, push this uh, slide for you, ma'am. Uh, you can go ahead with the introduction of the speakers of the evening, ma'am. So a very warm good evening to everybody. I hope that I am audible. Yeah, ma'am. Perfectly okay, ma'am. So thank you, Mr. Ehsan. And uh, welcome everybody to the Calcium Masterclass, the pinnacle of coronary intervention. And we have a galaxy of experts with us this evening. And uh, 
we also have a very esteemed panel uh, who's going to be deliberating and giving very interesting lectures. So we'll start with Dr. Stuart Watkins. Dr. Stuart Watkins is a consultant cardiologist at the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, which is one of the biggest cardiac catheterization labs in the UK. And he has a huge experience in complex PCI. And together with the team in Glasgow, he's one of the first using the shockwave C2 catheter way back in 2018. Welcome, Dr. Stuart Watkins. He will be followed by Dr. G. Sengotuvelu, who is a senior consultant and intervention cardiologist at Apollo Hospital, Greens Road, Chennai. He is an accomplished leader in complex PCI and stenting and is also very good at structural heart interventions, including TAVI and microclip and other such procedures. Welcome. And Dr. Sengotovelu will be followed by Dr. S. Manoj, who will be giving us a very interesting lecture. In his senior consultant and interventional cardiologist at the Kaveri Hospital, Chennai. He's also a veteran cardiologist, has performed a great number of invasive cardiac therapeutic and diagnostic interventional procedures. Our next speaker of the evening will be Dr. P.K. Sahu, senior consultant, and he's the cardiologist director, intervention cardiology at Apollo Hospital, Bhubaneswar. He's also adjunct associate professor of cardiology, Apollo Health Education and Research Foundation at Chennai. He's performed a very large number of procedures. He is the first to perform dual chamber AICD and CRTD. He's also authored many reputed articles in many leading journals and is a major believer in the role of imaging in PCI. Welcome, Dr. Sahu. And our last speaker for the evening will be Dr. Subhash Chandra. He's presently working as chairman and head of department of cardiology at BLK Max Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi. He's a very trusted name in the field of cardiology, and he has successfully performed a very large number of complex cardiology procedures and has been honored with numerous national and international awards. Welcome, Dr. Chandra. And our galaxy on the expert panel. Uh, we have Dr. Apoor Vasavada with us, who is a, the senior most cardiologist at Surat City, and he's also known for his technical strategy in complex cases. He is director and chief intervention cardiologist of TriStar Hospital with more than 25 years of experience in cardiology. On the expert panel, we also have a young cardiologist, Dr. Gautam Swaro from Lucknow, who's extending catheter treatment for structural heart diseases also in the city large number of procedures done by him. His professional affiliation is with the Lucknow-based Sahara Hospital and Hari Spandan Clinic, and he's one of the top users of lithotripsy in the large state of Uttar Pradesh. On our expert panel, we also have Dr. Puneet Varma. He's well known. His experience in cardiology is almost of three decades in both adult and pediatric procedures. He's an authority in angioplasty device closures, PPI, AICD, he runs a very successful primary angioplasty program at the Ace Heart and Vascular Institute in Mohali. Welcome, Dr. Pani. We also have with us on the expert panel, Dr. Rajesh T, who is head of department and professor of the Department of Cardiology School of Medicine, Amrita Kochi. And his interest lies in cardiac CT, imaging, radial access complex coronary intervention. He is an avid teacher and has been an examiner for the DNB program and published numerous uh, papers and chapters in numerous books. We also have with us on the expert panel, Dr. Raj Shekhar Varma, a senior consultant at Astor Med City Kochi, renowned intervention cardiology in that region, and has an experience which is vast of more than 15 years. He's an expert in chip CTOs and a very skilled at procedures of left main, multivessel disease, bifurcation, calcific lesions for which we are here today, and amazing. We also have with us on the expert panel, Dr. Saurabh Mehrotra, who's a cardiologist in uh, PGI MER, a very reputed institute in our country. He's additional professor there, and he's one of the early adopters of the shockwave technology in North India. And so, 
We would now like to invite our first speaker for the evening, Dr. Scott Watkins. He will be talking about the TCT data and also about the, his experience with shockwave therapy. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Rao, and thanks very much for the, the kind introduction. And uh, it's also a great honour to get to speak to you all today. And it really is a, a great honour to, to join uh, such an esteemed uh, company of expert cardiologists. So I've been asked to speak about the latest TCT highlights uh, regarding uh, shockwave intravascular lithotripsy uh, and my experience uh, with this. Now, when I was given the invitation to, to speak to you today, I was hoping to have some good news about the India versus Scotland cricket match in the T20 World Cup. Uh, unfortunately, uh, India won by eight wickets. I'm not sure what the Scotsman's smiling about. Uh, India had 81 balls left, so well and truly thumped. Uh, for those of you who have never been to Scotland, this was the one sunny day we had in Scotland this year, where we've got a satellite image. Scotland occupies the top half of the, uh, the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, we're usually covered in cloud and our, our colleagues in England bask in the sunlight. However, underneath the clouds and on sunny days, we have some uh, exceptional, beautiful landscapes. And I certainly would encourage you all to visit Scotland if you get the chance. Now, unfortunately, in Scotland, we do, however, have a major problem. And our major problem is coronary artery disease. And you can see here from the historic World Health Organization Monica project that Glasgow, where I'm speaking to you from just now, um, had the second highest incidence of acute coronary syndromes in the whole of Europe. So we really do have a, a major problem here. Now, uh, as the introduction said, I, I work at the Golden Jubilee National Hospital uh, in Glasgow. We cover for coronary artery disease a 2.2 million population. Uh, however, we also host the National Transplant Centre and Adult Congenital Centre, and that covers a population of 4.4, sorry, 5.4 million uh, for the entire country. Our cath lab is the busiest in the United Kingdom. We do roughly 3,000 percutaneous coronary interventions per annum, uh, around 750 uh, primary PCIs. We do roughly 150 TAVI procedures. This is likely to, to increase over the next year, as well as a whole range of other uh, complex procedures. Now, today, I'm going to go through the one-year results from the Disrupt CAD3 trial. I'm going to talk about the patient level pooled analysis of the OCT substudies from all the CAD trials. I'm then going to talk about OCT character characterization of eccentric versus concentric calcification uh, when, when you're treating these lesions using shockwave, um, and also shockwave for the treatment of calcified nodules. And then, hopefully, if time will permit, I'm going to show a couple of cases uh, that we have done here in Glasgow. So the first study that was presented at TCT was by Jonathan Hill, and this was a one-year results of the DISRUPT-CAD3 trial. Now, the DISRUPT-CAD3, this was a prospective multi-center, single-arm global IDA study. It was conducted in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France. And these were for heavily calcified arteries. There were 47 global sites. Each site was allowed one roll-in patient, so that was 47 patients. And the intention to treat population was 384 patients. And what I'm going to present today is the one-year follow-up. 100 patients went into an OCT sub-study as well. So the one-year follow-up analysis included MACE, which was a composite of cardiac death, MI, or target vessel revascularization, target lesion failure, stent thrombosis, and a subgroup analysis for MACE and target vessel revascularization, and also the predictors of MACE and TVR at one year. Now, the inclusion criteria uh, just to remind everyone this way, well, you had to have negative biomarkers, you had to have an ejection fraction of over 25%. Uh, you had to have a severe stenosis angiographically between 70 and 100%. However, uh, if you were between 50 and 70%, you did have to have evidence of ischemia, and that was by fractional flow reserve of less than or equal to 0.8, or a lumen area of less than or equal to 4 millimeters squared by IVIS or OCT. Now, the vessels had to be, be between 2.5 and 4 millimeters in diameter, with a lesion length of less than 40 millimetres. Now, the definition of severe calcification had to be either tram line calcification involving both sides of the vessel wall with a total calcium length of greater than 15 millimetres, uh, or the presence of greater than 270 degrees of calcium on at least one cross section by either IVIS or OCT. Exclusions were renal failure, 
and a recent MI. Now, the study did excellently with a 97.1 follow-up. So follow-up was achieved for 373 patients, uh, which was excellent. You can see here that the, the average age was 71 years. 90% of the patients had hypertension or hypercholesterolemia. The majority of the vessels uh, were LEDs, followed by right coronary arteries and then followed by circumflex coronary arteries. Uh, the average lesion length was 26 millimeters with a calcified length of 48 millimeters. And the core lab adjudicated that every lesion uh, met the criteria for severe calcification. Procedure time was around an hour. Um, IVL pulses was 69 uh, on average with an average number of stents at 1.3 and stent delivery was excellent at 99.2%. So the early results back in 2020 showed that the OCT Substudy managed to achieve a minimum stent area of 6.5 millimeters squared and stent expansion of 101 to 102%, which is truly excellent. So MACE at 30 days was 7.8%, and the one year MACE was 13.8%, which was a truly excellent result. If you look at the individual components of MACE, cardiac death was 1.1%, target vessel revascularization at 6%, and MI was 10.5%. And MI at one year was driven entirely by non-Q-wave MI. There was no Q-wave MI events uh, beyond 30 days. Second, all-cause mortality was 1.8%, uh, with target lesion failure of 11.9%. Uh, this was all driven by target vessel MI at 9.9%. There was only one stent thrombosis found in the study beyond 30 days. And if you look at one year MACE by different subgroups, only lesion length greater than 25 millimeters was associated with MACE. And you look at the, the one year target vessel revascularization by subgroup, there was absolutely no difference between any of the subgroups studied. On the multivariate analysis, um, bifurcation lesions, prior MI and current or former smoking was associated with MACE, and prior MI was only associated with target vessel revascularization. So in conclusion, this study represented the largest and longest clinical follow-up with patients with severely calcified lesions that are treated with intravascular lithotripsy. And coronary IVL prior to drug lifting stent implantation resulted in a beneficial impact of IVL lesion calcium modification and stent expansion to at least one year. So MACE and target vessel revascularization rates were similar in most subgroups analyzed. However, long lesions greater than 25 millimeters um, was only association, and this was by periprocedural non-Q-wave MI in relation to one year MACE. The next study that was presented at TCT was by Zid Ali, uh, and this was a patient level pooled analysis of the Disrupt CAD OCT substudies. Now, there's now been four uh, CAD studies. Uh, in each of them, I've had an OCT subgroup. If you have had two, three, two hundred, these patients have had their OCT uh, images examined by the core laboratory at the CRF in New York. Baseline and lesion characteristics are very similar to that of the Disrupt CAD 3 trial. And as far as procedural characteristics are concerned, as you'd imagine when you do OCT, the procedure time was slightly longer at 70 minutes and the contrast volume was slightly higher at 207 mils. Um, the average number of pulses delivered for the OCT patients was 87 uh, per patient. And again, the stents were 1.3 uh, as before. Interestingly, two thirds of patients had visible calcium fractures by OCT and one third had no visible calcium fractures seen at all. The average number of calcium fractures per lesion was 3.2. And two thirds of patients had over one fracture per lesion and two thirds had full thickness calcium fractures demonstrated. You can see here that the minimal luminal area was not collated with, not co-located with pre-procedural maximum calcium site. And you can see in this case, you have a, a, an artery with quite diffuse calcification, almost circumferential. You can see you have nice calcium fractures 
uh, produced by intravascular orthotripsy and a nice stent expansion uh, result after stenting. So the MSA by OCT on average was six uh, with a stent expansion of 103%. So an absolutely excellent result um, from IVL in these cases. Interestingly, the number of visible calcium fractures, uh, the maximum calcium thickness, uh, the maximum superficial continuous calcium arc and the length of the continuous calcium greater than 270 degrees, none of these parameters were a predictor of stent expansion. The only predictor of stent expansion uh, was the size of your balloon to artery ratio. Uh, so the, the largest uh, post elation balloon that you use or the stent balloon used uh, during the procedure. So good stent expansion is achieved regardless of the calcium burden or the visible calcium fracture if you use intravascular lithotripsy. This is an important finding. And also very reassuringly, in these patients, there were zero serious angiographic complications. No perforations, no abrupt closures, no, no reflow, slow flow, no distal embolization. And just think of that in terms of other procedures such as rotational atherectomy uh, and uh, orbital atherectomy. The 30-day MACE was 4.6%, and this was driven entirely by non-Q-wave MI. And this really confirms the safety of intravascular lithotripsy treatment in treating coronary calcification. So this represented the largest evaluation of intravascular lithotripsy by OCT. There were no serious angiographic complications observed, confirming the safety of IVL in treating severe calcification. Uh, OCT demonstrated extensive calcium fracture after IVL treatment with excellent stent expansion uh, of severely calcified lesions. And visible calcium fracture and calcium characteristics were not predictors of stent expansion. And we'll go on to why that might be in a second. The next part of the uh, of OCT studies at uh, TCT was that looking at eccentric uh, compared to concentric calcium. Now, if you divide um, calcification into four quadrants, so less than 180 degrees, 181 to 270 degrees, 271 to 359 degrees, and then finally 360 degrees, they managed to have a nice group of between 50 and 66 patients in, in, in each of these groups. Now, as far as the procedural characteristics were concerned, it didn't matter your degree of calcification, all the lesions were treated the same. The same number of pulses were delivered by IVL, the same amount of post dilation was performed, the same number of stents were inserted. There was absolutely a similar approach across each of the calcium quartiles. Interestingly, despite this, and despite the amount of calcium, you get consistent outcomes, even if you have eccentric calcification. The MSA is the same, uh, no matter what quartile you're in, and your stent expansion is also the same. No significant difference between the four groups. And you can see here the impact of IVL in treating eccentric calcium. You can see here there's only maybe 90 degrees of calcification. You perform IVL, you have a nice calcium fracture here. And when you place the stent, you get excellent luminal gain in a very concentric manner. Here you can see an artery with more, maybe almost up to 250, 260 degrees of calcification. You can see IVL has again resulted in a very nice calcium fracture uh, with excellent luminal gain in the concentric pattern after stenting. And here's an artery with 360 degrees of calcification by OCT. You get more fractures on this occasion. You can see you've got two very nice deep uh, fractures and again, an excellent result uh, from stenting. More calcification equates to more visible fractures. So you can see as you go across the quartiles, you can see a stepwise increase in visible calcium fractures and also the number of visible fractures per lesion. And these are both statistically significant. But despite the level of calcification, you get consistent mineral stent area and stent expansion, regardless of the, the visible calcification. You can see here, even if you don't see any visible fractures, you still have the same um, stent area across the board, no matter what your, your degree of calcification is. And uh, OCT may not detect subtle microfractures micro in calcified plaque. And you may have already seen this slide from Reno Vermani, where micro CT is able to detect microfractures within the calcification 
which you don't pick up with OCT. So OCT demonstrates consistent MSA and stent expansion outcomes in eccentric and concentric calcium. You get increased IVL induced calcium fracture, which is observed in proportion to the amount of calcium. The more calcium, the more fractures you get. However, consistent MSA and stent expansion outcomes were observed regardless of the presence of visible calcium fractures. And perhaps micro CT is what you need to do in order to be able to see these fractures. The final study that was presented at TCT was by Akiko Mihara, and this was looking at the treatment of calcified nodules. And I'm sure all of us have experience of calcified nodules and how difficult they are to treat. I'm sure you know already there are two types of calcified nodule. You've got the eruptive calcified nodule, which has an irregular surface, and you get nodular calcification, uh, which is a smooth surface and has a very thick fibrous cap, not what we like to find in the cath lab. So you can see here uh, the OCT appearance of a calcified nodule is very dramatic when you see it, uh, usually it distills fear in all of us. And you can see here with intravascular lithotripsy, you get a very nice fracture uh, within the calcified nodule. And then you can see here, they've actually had eccentric stent expansion. So there's different patterns of stent expansion depending on the type of calcified nodule. So this is a deformed eruptive nodule, irregular surface. And you can see when they've stented, you've got nice concentric stent expansion. You can see here we've got a deformed nodular calcification. And again, concentric expansion of the stent. However, when you have non-deformed nodular calcification with a thick cap, you get very eccentric expansion of your stent. The majority of the calcified nodules in this study were found in the right coronary artery. As you would expect, it's the most tortuous coronary vessel uh, that we deal with. However, with stenting, the outcomes were similar. If you had a calcified nodule or a non-calcified nodule lesion, you have consistent MSA and stent expansion in both, and that was across the board. And you can see here that the, the number of visible calcium fracture and visible fractures per lesion was significantly higher in calcified nodules. So OCT again demonstrates consistent MSA uh, and stent expansion outcomes regardless of the presence of calcified nodules. And deformation of calcified nodules was observed following treatment with IVL. And we suspect that IVL, the, the actual acoustic shock waves, affect deep calcium, deep, deep to the calcified nodule, allowing stent expansion. And increased visible calcium fracture was observed in calcified nodule lesions, likely due to increased calcium concentricity. Now, if you'd like, I'm going to show a couple of cases now from my own institution, uh, just to demonstrate our experience or some of the uses of uh, intravascular lithotripsy. Uh, this is a 67 year old man who has new angina. He's developed this 20 years after bypass surgery and is having angina despite four anti-anginal agents. Yeah, this culminated in admission to hospital with troponin negative chest pain. Uh, he's a background of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease. He was fairly athletic by Scottish standards by, with a BMI of 35. And despite a arthritis. Had an anagram performed, and this demonstrated severe native coronary disease. Previous LED and a good graft is obtuse marginal, but the culprit for the escalation in these symptoms appeared to be an occluded vein graft to the right coronary artery. So he returned to our institution in Glasgow uh, for PCI to his native right coronary artery, given the severity of his angina. Now, this is his right coronary artery, and this procedure uh, was undertaken by one of my colleagues. I can't claim responsibility for this. Um, this is the, the right coronary artery which came to be treated. You can see quite severe disease in the proximal vessel and distally and a, a small segment in the middle of the vessel, which doesn't look too bad. So my colleague, he pre-dilated using a 2.5 millimeter semi-compliant balloon and then a three millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon uh, to the whole vessel top to bottom. He then stented, he used overlapping uh, Promus Premier drug looking stents, a three by 38 and a three five by 38. And then he post dilated using a 3.5 millimeter non-compliant balloon. Now you will note in the proximal vessel here in the right hand frame, that the non-compliant balloon is under expanded. So he then took a score flex balloon, so a scoring balloon, 
a non-compliant scoring balloon, and he took this up to 22 atmospheres, and you can see the balloon is still under-expanded. So desperate times call for desperate measures. So he took a 3.5 millimeter OPN balloon. I don't know if you have these uh, in India. This is a, a double coated, double layered balloon. And he was able to take this up to 40 atmospheres. And you can see 40 atmospheres, again, still wasn't expanded and just resulted in a very nice proximal dissection within the right coronary artery. Again, not an ideal situation. So he elected to cover the proximal dissection using a short drug loathing stent, uh, and he postulated this. Now, at that time, in 2018, we didn't have any intravascular lithotripsy, um, though we knew it was going to come, um, and we arranged for it to, to be present in order for us to do a live case for besis. So this is two weeks later. His angina is much better, but his coronary arteries and the proximal vessel remains as it was. We took a non-compliant balloon again. You can see how well constrained the balloon is, complete an expansion despite 20 atmospheres. We took some nice, these are stent vessel vis and stent vis images. And you can just see how badly constrained uh, the, um, the, the stent was. This is the, the 3538 stent. The proximal end of it is encased in calcification, a really strange appearance. And you can actually see that the stent he put in to tack up the dissection, he actually thought it was overlapping given that the vessel was so calcified, but you can see he's left a wee gap uh, between, between the stents, so a pretty, pretty unusual uh, appearance. And you can see we did some optical coherence tomography, and again, you know, this confirms you've got beautiful stent apposition, but complete under expansion of the proximal end of the stent. Uh, you can see in the cross-section view, we've got crowding uh, over strength struts uh, where the vessel is completely under-expanded. You can see the extent of the calcification in the gap between the two stents, almost circumferential uh, calcium, as you would expect. So we took a 3.5 by 12 millimeter shockwave balloon, and within 10 pulses, you can see already we have good expansion of the, the, the proximal end of the stent. Um, so we then repeated, this is the, the pre-stent vessel vis image, and this is post uh, IVL as well. And you can see how nicely expanded uh, the stent is now. Fairly beautiful images. We repeated the OCT, and you can see, as we'd expect, IVL has caused nice uh, fractures uh, within the vessel in the gap. And you can also see there are some fractures um, within the stented segment as well. So we then stented the proximal right coronary using a 4x16 uh, Promus Premier stent. And you can see here that our immediate angiographic result is very satisfactory um, with a now fully expanded proximal stent. The final OCT was excellent with great expansion, great stent apposition. And the area where we had the under expanded stent, you can see we've got double layer struts now, and you can see there is still very minimal protrusion into the lumen, however, a great uh, angiographic result in the end. So this patient, we, we thought we'd seen the, the end of him. Uh, however, six months later, he developed acute breathlessness and had pink frothy sputum. He attended a local accident emergency department, was treated with oxygen and furosemide. His troponin was negative and his chest x-ray was okay. Uh, however, he did describe some minor chest discomfort which settled with isosorbide and mononitrate. Now, given this was the first time that intravascular lithotripsy had been used within a stent in a live case in the UK, the base hospital cardiologist wanted to repeat angiogram just to see what was going on. And we, we took him back to the cath lab and you can see the stent is still beautifully widely patent, uh, I guess, in keeping with the, the CAD3 results. And here's the patient here, a very nice gentleman uh, indeed. And the last case I'm going to show you, this is an 85-year-old man. He's got CCS class 3 angina, despite three anti-anginal agents. He had a high-risk end stemi and had PCI to his mid-LED in isolation. However, he had significant residual disease um, of his other coronary arteries. And this was him coming back to have his left main stem bifurcation treated. He has got mild left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So this is the angiogram 
and you can see there is a stent in the mid LED. You can see a horrible calcified shelf light lesion at the ostium of the circumflex. You can see he has severe calcified proximal LED disease in the run into the previous uh, stented segment. So lots of calcium, lots of disease, and uh, fairly typical Scottish arteries. So this was the OCT within the circumflex. You can see the calcification here is relatively superficial uh, with a lot of blood swell that, uh, with this uh, OCT run. We can see the calcification is relatively superficial in the OCT uh, pullback. Not, not as thick uh, of calcification as we're going to see in a second uh, within the LED. And in here is the LED. So you can see here, again, unfortunately, a lot of swirl at the start of the run. However, a lot thicker calcification by OCT. And you can also see the calcification within the LED is a lot deeper within the vessel. Um, so this led us to think about our strategy. You can see we've got a dissection here as we predilated LED in order to uh, deliver the OCT uh, catheter. So as far as our strategy was concerned, given the superficial nature of the calcium within the circumflex, in an attempt to debulk uh, the osteo circumflex disease, we decided to treat the circumflex with high-speed rotational atherectomy, uh, and also to avoid plaque shift into the LED when, when we come to doing bifurcation stenting of the left main stem. You can see in the, the LED, uh, our balloon was completely constrained prior to the previous stent. And given the, the OCT appearances of deep calcification and thick calcification within the LED, we elected to treat this with intravascular uh, lithotripsy. So we stented, we put a pinning stent in the LED. You can see there a three by 24 drug eluting stent. And then we've used a cutting balloon at the ostium of the circumflex prior to stenting from the circumflex back into the left main stem uh, with a 3.5 by 20. Uh, drug looting stent, allowing enough room uh, for proximal optimization. We've then uh, performed proximal optimization. We've recrossed into the LED uh, and we've stented the uh, open the struts and stented from the LED uh, back into the left main stem and finished uh, with a pot balloon. We've also done a final kissing balloon inflation, as you can see here. And this was our final angiographic result. So this is a nice case of using where you don't want to lose your wires. We, we're a big, we use a lot of clot technique here in Glasgow, as opposed to DK Crush. And this is another way of maintaining your wires. So you don't have to pull your wire in order to do rotational atherectomy in both vessels. So we use the burr for the circumflex um, and IVL for the LED with a very nice angiographic result. So in conclusion, IVL is a safe and effective treatment for severely calcified coronary artery disease, as proven by the studies that was presented at TCT. Uh, OCT has shown extensive calcium fractures from intravascular lithotripsy, resulting in excellent stent expansion and severe coronary calcification. And consistent MSA and stent expansion outcomes were achieved in eccentric and concentric calcium. And this is one of the biggest messages I think we have to take from TCT. And it's also effective in treating calcified nodules. Again, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to present today, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. And uh, the cases which you showed at the end were very excellently done, especially uh, demonstrating the use that when you don't want to lose your wire in any vessel, then IVL is the way forward. So that was a very interesting case of uh, combination use of both rotavulation and lithotripsy. I just wanted to ask you, so initially when you showed the data uh, of the, uh, the TCT data, what I noticed was that, you know, only 55% of the patients were pre-dilated before using uh, the IVL. So uh, do you think that uh, when it comes to, an, because we know that the IVL balloon is a little bulky, so do you think that when it would come to an all-comers uh, population, IVL may not perform so well? Yeah, you make a very good point there. You know, it is a slightly bulky balloon. Uh, I'd say it's 
we, we also have the Wolverine balloon here, and it's quite similar to that. It does take a little bit of push to, to deliver it in severe calcification. So I'm not surprised that predilation had to be performed with a normal non-compliant balloon in order to deliver the IVL balloon. Um, as the trial was conducted over many sites, and um, you know, I, I think I think the the results of the trial uh, will stand when when, when uh, it goes out for routine use. I think it's uh, excellent technology, and um, I think the majority of centres will probably predilate prior to delivering an IVL balloon just to make sure you deliver it. Last thing you want to do is you know cause an issue when you're trying to push hard on a balloon trying to get it into place. So I think I would recommend predilating uh, prior to taking an IVL balloon. Uh, we would I, like some comments from the expert panel. Yes. If I can make a comment, if anybody else is there, others I want to make a comment. No, you're welcome. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. Okay. I just want to make one comment and one question. So my comment is, uh, if you have an underexpanded stent, which is eccentrically expanded, uh, we have found that IVL really doesn't help. If you have a concentric underexpansion, it really helps. But in my experience, we have seen. Uh, few of the cases where we had a post IVL after under expanded stand. Uh, it sometimes doesn't work when you have a very eccentric uh, under expansion. That's one. And the question is, have you had any experience with uh, uh, IVL and leaving it alone without a stand? So you make a very good point about um, eccentric under expanded stents. I don't have much experience of that. Certainly We've had quite a few under-expanded stents where we've taken IVL and IVL has produced a nice result. Um, I think gone are the days where we used to do stent ablation with rotational atherectomy through a stent um, to try and modify and increase your MSA. So I think I think IVL is, is useful. Um, obviously, you get more fractures with the more concentric calcification, um, and perhaps that's the reason why you don't get such nice results. But I think the, the TCT has shown that you can still use, not, not within a stent, but in the eccentric calcification, you get really nice results. Um, your second, your, the question you mentioned, so what was your second question? Well, and do you have any experience where you used IVL, uh, just IVL alone and leaving it without a stent? Yeah, not in the coronaries, no. I have done it in the peripheral vessels. You know, we're also a big TAVI center and we've used shockwave in the legs um, and we, we've left it. Uh, it wasn't made any major dissections, so but I've never had, I've never done it within the coronary vessels now. So I will. Um, in many cases, it's also used as a bailout situation for us when we get stuck with an. Um, you think that you've prepared the bed well enough, and you implant the stent, and then you end up with an underexpanded stent. So we've many times used it as a bailout situation also, and it works pretty well. Yeah. So I have a few other... questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Apuro here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. A few Dr. questions. Apuro, one is. Ahead. Yeah. One is that uh, the sizing of the balloon is very very important to get a good result, as we have been mentioning. So, is an imaging must before using the IVL because sometimes the sizing is difficult without the imaging in a, a diffuse disease. Number one. The second question is, uh, how many times you have had to use. Uh, say an OPN balloon or an extra high pressure balloon after using the IVL after putting this tent. Okay. And third question is that you showed those gaps remaining in the cracks. So once you implant this tent and there are deep cracks caused by the IVL, there are some gaps remaining. Do they, they are they likely to cause problem in future? For yeah, as far as imaging is concerned, I think you should image all the time, and you can't image enough um, in these cases. One as you say correctly, to, in order to correctly size the IVL balloon, you want to do one-to-one -one sizing. Um, so I would, I would always image, and also image as well, to see what the IVL has done. Now, you may not see any visible calcium fractures, but that doesn't matter because, as I say, there may be micro fractures within the calcium that you can't see by OCT. But it is quite reassuring when you're doing a case if you do see nice splits in the calcium um, and if you do get very nice images as well. Um, we always post LA in Glasgow. We all, we we'll perform IVL and then we'll always take a non-compliant balloon. I haven't had the case yet where I've had to take an OPN balloon after IVL. Usually, IVL has done the trick, and then just a simple non-compliant balloon. Again, one-to-one -one sizing has done the trick. Uh, I've not I've not had to take a, a, an OPN after um, IVL. 
Um, and you mentioned about the gaps caused by the, the fractures. I, you know, I don't think there's, nobody really knows if these cause problems in the future, certainly out to one year. Uh, they don't appear to cause any major problems. I'm sure the stent struts that are over the cracks just endothelialize as they do uh, in normal circumstances. Um, so I'm, I'm not too concerned about, about gaps. Thank you. I, I have a question. Oh. Like when you have an under-expanded stent, like you had in a particular case, how do you think a, a cutting balloon would actually help you? Because the calcium is deep, is placed deep and it's behind the stent. So I really feel that cutting balloon is again an expensive technology and using a cutting balloon in an underexpanded stent doesn't really make any sense. Yeah. Another thing is using an IVL in this situation may produce good results, but you think it's an on-label or it's an off-label indication as far as the usage of IVL in an underexpanded stent is concerned. My third question is that in your experience, how many patients post IVL would require a cutting balloon to produce better cracks and so that you can achieve a better MSA and a better eccentricity index after following stent implantation. And many a times, you know, you don't get as good fractures on an OCT post IVL as you expect them to be. And do you think that you need to deploy a stent right away? In other words, what are the criteria to uh, predict the success of IVL that following an IVL, you would achieve a good MSA following stent implantation? Many a times you see only minor fractures and you deploy a stand and probably you may not get a very good MSA. So you, how do you decide that following an IVL, you need to follow up this patient with a cutting balloon to produce deeper cracks so that once you deploy a stand, you get a good MSA. Thanks very much. Yeah, you covered quite a, a lot of things there. Um, as far, yeah, I agree with you, you know, taking a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon as in the case that I showed to try and improve the expansion of a stand. I think this was an act of desperation. Um, and I don't know what your own experience is with the OPN balloons, but you know I find as well you go to forty atmospheres within a stent, and maybe increase the MSA by point something, but nothing, nothing dramatic. And I think that's you now whether whether or not using IVL in this circumstance is on label, off label. I suspect it's possibly off label, but it works. You know, and we've used it a number of times, and I've seen a number of meetings where people have presented cases we use IVL in this circumstance is very, very effective. And I have done stent ablation in the past um, for under-expanded stents, you know, taking rotational atherectomy. It's a horrible experience. We've probably all done it. Uh, but again, you, you never, ever achieved great results. I think really IVL is the only treatment that we have available for severe stent under-expansion. Um, I think it's a, it's a really big advance uh, in that area. Um, you asked about taking a cutting balloon post IVL. Um, I usually find just a non-compliant balloon. If you take a, a non-compliant balloon, one-to-one -one sizing, I think that's an important thing. So if you've imaged the vessel, it's a 3.5 vessel, you take a 3.5 non-compliant balloon, you go up to high pressure. Um, for me, that is that has done the trick on, on the majority of occasions. I can, uh, it's pretty rare that I've had to reach for a Wolverine uh, balloon or I sometimes take a score flex afterwards and that's usually a kind of reaction you, you, you do OCT and as you say sometimes you don't see nice splits and you don't see calcium fractures um, and then I've therefore taken a scoring balloon uh, after IVL um, but I think the data out of TCT shows it doesn't really, you don't need to see fractures in order to achieve a good MSA and achieve a uh, good stent expansion I think there are micro fractures there that you just don't see um, criteria to predict the success of IVL you also mentioned um, yeah I think obviously the more fractures you see then you can you, you think you're going to get a better uh, stent, stent, stent result but that's not always the case so, so, so this boils down to the fact that once you've done a pre uh, a pre OCT after passing a wire and you're, you've seen that you have say a 360 degree arc of deep calcium or a 270 degree arc of deep deep calcium and you assess the vessel size and everything that you don't need to repeat an OCT following uh, an IVL because even if you don't get micro fractures and you've achieved a satisfactory expansion of the IVL balloon at six atmospheres, it means mm -hmm. probably you've done the job. Then why repeat an OCT? You can do an OCT before and then you can do an OCT after stent implantation. Yeah. I think I would also be, I would also be reassured by taking a non-compliant balloon after the IVL just mm -hmm. to be sure it goes up fully because you're not going to six atmospheres 
uh, with the IVL balloon once you've delivered the 10 shocks. So I think it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a good technique to take a non-compliant balloon uh, as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent comments, Dr. Watkins. Dr. Saurabh, it's still an off-label indication, but I think operators both in India and abroad have been using it for under-expanded uh, stents and with very successful results. Also, uh, Dr. Segutuvelu, imaging, uh, you know, is uh, wonderful, but 80% of our centers in India are still not equipped with imaging. So I think that if we have imaging, it's perfect. But if we don't have imaging, it should not deter the operators from going ahead because uh, we've still been having very good results. And in many of the large trials, you'll see that the amount of imaging used was uh, still uh, not more than 50%. So imaging is wonderful if you don't, it should not deter our operators in many of the places we're doing excellent work. And uh, in our experience, uh, post ideal, most of we also go ahead with a non-compliant balloon Rarely we've been uh, required to go in with an OPNNC. Dr. Watkins, we do have OPNNC in India, and uh, it has a very high amount of usage in across all centers in India. Uh, any other comments from our uh, expert panel? Uh, just, Dr. Watkins, just a question. Dr. Puneet Varma, we would like to have your comments, please. Yeah, wonderful uh, lecture and body of information, Dr. Watkins. I was uh, just wondering, what is the role here, what IVUS would actually occupy, knowing that in India, we use a lot of IVUS in our labs versus OCT. And once uh, we are sure that the only predictor of stent expansion is a balloon to artery ratio, and uh, the fractures really don't matter much, then uh, do you think an IVUS, uh, pre and post would do the job versus an OCT. Yeah, no, you can you can obviously see nice fractures uh, using IVUS as well. We had, we had a nice case last night where we used uh, IVUS in a patient with an EGFR of 18. So you're always going to get patients where you, you, you can't do OCT. And I think IVUS for sizing and for looking at fractures. But as you say, you know, in, if there are centers which don't have access to intravascular imaging, I think that's even more of a case for taking a, a non-compliant balloon. And if you are going to take a, a non-compliant balloon to assess your expansion, make sure you take it in two views. So, you know, areo cranial and an areo caudal, uh, two different projections to make sure that your, your balloon is expanded. Can I make a comment on that? I think the major advantage that OCT has over IVUS in this particular situation would be because IVL is more effective when there's deep calcium rather than the superficial calcium. And normally, if you, uh, IVUS does not pick up deep calcium because it cuts down acoustic rays. So if you have a little bit of superficial calcium as well as deep calcium, deep calcium would not be appreciated on an IVUS because of acoustic shadowing. And that is where is the limitation of IVUS in justifying the usage of uh, IVL. Whereas if you have a good circumferential deep calcium on an OCT, you know that this is an ideal candidate for a IVL. Yeah. I agree. want a question from uh, Dr. Watkins, just a short question. Uh, you didn't mention the how much uh, the amount of pulses you given in the RCA as well as the lady. So in uh, I just want to ask your experience regarding if you find that the, the arc of calcium is like 270 or uh, 3 uh, all around the calcium, uh, around the arc, then what would be the minimum uh, pulses in which you expect that the this calcium might fracture your uh, segment and then you can successfully uh, uh, go to the other segment. So is there any uh, amount of pulses that it is in your mind that or what amount of pulses it should be given in the there is 360 arc or 270 arc? What is your practice pattern? Okay, um, there's a little bit of break up there in, in the question, but I think what you're asking is what the criteria for using it. Certainly, if um, more than 180 degrees of Calcium, if it's more than half a millimeter in thickness and more than five millimeters in length, certainly would be our sort of local sort of protocol. We're, we're in quite a lot of um, fiscal constraints within the, the National Health Service, and certainly these are our criteria for uh, for using in, uh, you know either rotational atherectomy uh, or intravascular lithotripsy. So more than half a millimeter in thickness more than five millimeters and more than 180 degrees arc. So if 
if Dr. Watkins, if I may ask you put a question forward for the sake of learning of the audience which is there on this webinar, where would you place the rotablation today in your armamentarium uh, where IVL cases are being shown here? Uh, what, how would you choose and how would you get away with the IVL if it's not available to you at short notice? Uh, would you be able to accomplish a lot of your cases with simply having an in-house rotablation in your practice? Yeah. Um, so as, as Dr. Rao has already mentioned, you know, the, the IVL balloon is slightly bulky. Uh, I think there's always going to be cases where you're unable to deliver uh, the IVL balloon, certainly initially. Um, and in, the, in these cases, I think rotational atherectomy uh, still has a, has a place. Um, and obviously for superficial calcium as well. Um, in the case that I showed, the second case that I showed, where you're trying to debulk a lesion uh, as best you can in order to avoid plaque shift, uh, you know, right at the ostium of the circumflex, the ostium of the LED, um, it still has a, a role in these cases. But obviously, rotational atherectomy is a, obviously a great treatment for, for calcification as well. So it certainly still has a role, but um, getting the IVL balloon down to severe calcified lesions can sometimes be tricky. And you, we've had quite a few cases where we've had to rotablate and then take an IVL balloon afterwards. We call it a rotor shock case um, in order to be able to deliver stents. I think Dr. Subhash Chandra has brought in a very important point that uh, while IVL works very well, we still need rotational atherectomy in our lab. And uh, when you're dealing with a complex calcified lesion, it's important to have all the armamentarium available because there will be lesions in which the IVL balloon will be unable to access the lesion, which is where a rotor ablation comes in very useful and very handy. Uh, we'll take the final question from Dr. P.K. Sahu to Dr. Watkins. It was a very nice presentation. It was a, extremely useful to learn about the uh, uses of uh, IVL, especially in cases uh, where there is deep calcium. Now, uh, how, what is the incidence of using both rota and IVL in your series? what you do, pincers, rotatripsy, because that is the concept that uh, Dr. Rao also told and you also pointed out is something very exciting. Uh, is it that in an uncrossable lesion you first do a rota and then you put in IVL and then do it? What is your yeah. views about it? So I think we've had maybe half a dozen cases over the last year where we've had to me first of all, and then our usual practice then would be to take a heavyweight wire down and a non-compliant balloon. And I certainly had one case maybe a year ago where despite that, the non-compliant, despite rotational atherectomy with two bars, non-compliant balloon still wouldn't expand. And I've therefore taken a uh, <laughs> when it's a fairly infrequent, but you can achieve very, very nice results. So treating the superficial calcium spade, rotational atherectomy, and then using an intravascular lithotripsy to achieve the deep calcification treatment which you need in order to get good stent expansion. All right. Dr. Watkins, how many times have had you uh, have you had to take a second ideal balloon? Yeah, so again, not not very frequently, and again. And maybe because of the financial constraints within which we, we, we work, there, there are expensive balloons. Um, it's maybe happened maybe half a dozen times over the years, but not very frequently. And how frequently have you had rupture of the IVL balloon? Interesting you should say that. So I haven't really had any up until recently where we had one um, which ruptured. But to be fair, prior to that, two or three non-compliant balloons had ruptured as well. Um, and there's also just been a sharp calcified spur, but uh, it's a fairly infrequent occurrence, but it can happen and it has happened to us once. So uh, thank you, Dr. Watkins. Uh, that has been an amazing lecture and a very interesting uh, discussion by the panel. We'll uh, move on in the interest of time to our next talk by Dr. G. Sengotuvelu. He's going to be speaking about when the going is tough, how to get going. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, uh, so let me actually, I was about to talk on two cases of bifurcation. 
But I think uh, a lot of questions were there on rotablation. In our experience, we had to do rotablation two cases. So I would just show briefly your case and then move to the bifurcation. So, so you know the challenges of calcium, and these are the results of stenting. If you don't prepare the calcium very well, clearly you can have a, a malapose stent like this, uh, or you can have a great under expansion of the eccentric calcium. And if you use a balloon, sometimes you can dissect the wrong part of the vessel, leaving alone the calcified segment. So clearly, IVL has a big role to play. And uh, I will just show you quickly one case where we had to, we had two cases where we need to use a combination of several devices. Uh, this is one case where we had to use three devices to treat this calcium. This is an elderly man, 81 years old, with a, uh, with a acute coronary syndrome. You can see a long calcified lesion. Fluoroscopically, if you see two lines, the entire vessel uh, is seen as calcified. Very likely, these are all extensive calcification and needs proper preparation. Uh, this, uh, we can even see in fluoroscopy if imaging is not uh, available. So this patient uh, has a high bleeding risk patient. We put in a balloon. Uh, you can always do a test what you want to do if you are not imaging. And if you see an NC balloon crossing, then it's good. And, but you see here, there's a big waste here and the balloon doesn't open at all. So clearly we need to think of uh, one of the calcium modification devices. So we thought uh, the balloon has crossed, so likely IVL. So we used a three to 12 IVL balloon and clearly you can see that the balloon doesn't cross. One has to remember the emitters are well in the mid part of the balloon and just crossing the edge of the balloon doesn't really help. And uh, with, with desperate attempts with uh, using the guide liner and other stuff, we couldn't uh, get inside uh, inside the LAD. So we had to switch to rotablation. This is a 1.5 bar. And once we did a rotablation, I did an imaging. So this is to show how uh, rotablation helps compared to IVL. I think as I pointed out earlier, the, 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 you can see the, the rotablation actually has an effect on the superficial calcium. You can see some of the areas where you can see the areas where the that's uh, caused by the rota bar. But here, more importantly, you have to note the amount of calcium here. The, there is extensive calcification. The calcium arc is 180 degrees. The thick of calcium, there's very high thickness of calcium. Uh, if, you, if you score the calcium here, the calcium score is four, where you look at the thickness, which is very high, 360 degrees. More than 500 microns is thick calcium. Here we have um, around 1,000 microns in the, on the, on the three o'clock uh, area. And also the length of calcium, which is quite high, more than 10 millimeters, 18.3 millimeters. So it's clearly a, a severe calcium. Once we wrote ablated, we're able to take the IVL balloon. And you, I want you to appreciate how the waste disappears when we use the shocks, uh, when we deliver the shocks, as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this pointed out uh, highlighted area where the balloon, you can see the waste, which gradually uh, disappears as the shocks are being delivered. Once that was done, we repeated the uh, imaging just to show how an IVL uh, further helps uh, over rotablation. And here you can see there's some amount of dissection caused by the balloon. And as you more move towards more, you can see the calcium fractures uh, caused by the IVL. I think I'll quickly blaze through. You can see the cracks here. Uh, these are the uh, fractures caused by the IVL balloon. You can see it also in the 3D OCT. And uh, then finally, you can see that there is a still, if you look at the stent, we put a stent, we put a biofreedom stent after that. And after the stent, you see a lot of under expansion despite the use of IVL as well as the use of uh, uh, use of uh, uh, rotablation. In fact, we did uh, do a NC balloon dilatation and this is followed by stenting. And then we use an OPN balloon to post dilate. Again, this really helps at uh, 30, uh, 26 atmospheres. We were able to get a good expansion. There's a final result with OCT, you could see that there is a good expansion of the stent. So I think I'll move, this is the final angiography result. So I just showed this case so that there were a lot of questions on the rotablation. Let me move to the uh, two cases I wanted to show today. One is a, a critical left main. This patient is a 50-year-old main uh, who had a, a severe triple vessel disease. You can see the calcium in both the left main as well as in the LAD and the circumflex. He also had a total uh, CTO of the right coronary artery. His syntax was 36. But we, we were discussing about options of uh, CABC versus multivessel PCI. The patient opted for multivessel PCI as the first stage. We revascularized the RCA, the CTO. And, and today, we're going to talk, uh, uh, interest is the, uh, the left main PCI. So we did an OCT uh, to the left main and the LAD. And uh, uh, the LAD didn't have much. I can quickly show you there's not much of calcium, but there's more of a fibrocalcific lesion in the LAD. There is some amount of calcium in the LAD. But more importantly, there is some amount of calcium was seen in the left main, which I would want you to look at. There is a, there is a uh, move more towards the left main. Uh, there is a calcium now coming up, more of eccentric calcium uh, in the left main. 
So mm -hmm. this is the calcium in the left main and some amount of calcium in the LAD. The arc uh, is not very significant in the LED, but, but there's some, uh, and so what we decided to use, uh, treat the uh, the LED uh, with pre, with uh, just NC balloon dilatation and uh, strain the, uh, the, left, the, the LED. And this was followed by uh, pre-dilatation of the circumflex. And for left main, we decided to use the IVL, a 3.5 and 12 millimeter IVL. Again, it's, uh, you can see the, the, the waste in the balloon, and then this is post uh, IVL, you can see the waste disappearing. Again, when uh, using IVL, there are concerns of uh, including the left main for uh, delivering the shock, uh, which may take some time, but uh, most of the patients tolerate very well. And if they don't tolerate, you can always deflate the balloon and, and reduce the number of shocks. So this was uh, followed by, uh, this is, we, we decided to do a DK crush. And after pre-dilatation, uh, we thought that we could manage, uh, we couldn't image the circumflex because the OECT catheter couldn't go inside. So we thought we would manage uh, with the NC balloon, we were able to get a good amount of dilatation. And then we took a, uh, at 2.538 stent, which we were able to track in very well in the circumflex, and we treated this uh, with the DK crush uh, uh, technique. And you could see that and there is some amount of waste in the stent, uh, despite uh, pre, pre dilatation preparation and putting in a stent. And uh, in this situation, you can see the waste in the balloon, a small way uh, waste in the circumflex balloon. So in we treat uh, such a complex disease uh, with, the, with the long stents and the bifurcation, including the left main, it's important to have a very well expanded stent with good result to have a good outcome. So we decided to use a 2.5 well IVL again at, at, the, at the spot where the stent was uh, under expanded and we could get a good expansion of the stent uh, post IVL. And this was followed by the first kiss and then a stent in the, from the left main to the LAD. And this was followed by a pot and then a kissing balloon the, the, uh, the, this is followed by kissing balloon. This was the uh, final part, and uh, this is the final result. So we did a OCT again to look at the uh, the final result. This is the OCT into the uh, uh, circumflex where you could see the there's a good under person expansion of the stent. Post stenting, IVL really helped to get achieve uh, this kind of uh, expansion, and this was followed. You would also see that the distal edges were good. Right. Distal edges, uh, stent edges were good. And we did a, a OCT to the LED, a left main LED. And here we could see that uh, there is good expense. It's important to, uh, when you do a long stent, particularly the left main, we have to assess the OCT using the dual reference method where you split the artery into two. And if you look at the LED, it looks uh, have, it has good expansion of 91%. And also, uh, if you look at the left main, it's also having a good expansion of the 84%. And good areas we were able to achieve with the, with the areas of around nine and ten square millimeters. So uh, and uh, and uh, you could also see the the angle, the bifurcation. Uh, you can see the the final result uh, of the bifurcation on 3D. So the, the final result was uh, very good. Uh, this was the final angiographic result. I'm sorry, I think I had to go back. So I think this is the final result. So, so we had a good result, both angiographically and OCT. So now let me move to a, a second quick case. This is again a bifurcation with a long lesion, the LAD, and a diagonal lesion, which appears to be very tight at the ostium. So in this lesion, uh, we would we would we thought we should just plate the diagonal with a balloon and just stent the LAD. It looks like uh, uh, um, we would not have to treat it as a two stent technique. So we want to do a single stent technique for the LAD. So the plan was to wire both branches and pre-dilate, and uh, we, the OCT catheter, as you can see, could not cross, so we couldn't image this uh, LED. So we, we thought we will dilate the diagonal, but you could see that there is a there's a, this NC balloon. You could see a large waste in the ostium of the diagonal, and which is quite significant despite going high pressures. There's a waste was persisting. And at that point, we thought uh, it's better to treat and prepare the diagonal very well before putting the stent in the main branch because it might cause more problems or even, or even cause occlusion of the side branch if we don't treat the, di the diagonal well. So we decided to use a, a 2.512 IVL into the diagonal, again with 80 pulses. We were able to could see the waste in the balloon quite disappeared completely. And then we decided to use a diluting balloon for the diagonal. This was a, a magic touch, polymer saluting drug eluting balloon. And uh, once we delivered the drug eluting balloon for uh, about nine, about uh, uh, two minutes, uh, we then uh, treated the LED with uh, two with uh, long stents. And this is the final result. 
uh, you could see that uh, we could achieve a, a good uh, expansion of the stents in the in the LED. And the diagonal is nice and flowing. You could see the lesion. There is no significant residual lesion. So we didn't treat the diagonal with the stent. This is a single stent technique with the drug leading balloon at the branch. Thank you for your patient listening. Excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Sengo Tuvelu. Very interesting cases demonstrated by you with excellent results. Dr. Sengo Tuvelu, I just want to ask you that uh, with the ideal balloon, because uh, your diagonal was not dilating completely, and that is uh, probably because of the calcification which was there. Have you tried uh, using ideal in the LED and seen that the calcification at the ostium of the diagonal also breaks down? I, I didn't follow your question. Can, can, uh, place the balloon in the LED and the diagonal. So what, what was your question? So, many times we've seen when the ostium of the diagonal has calcification, a calcified lesion. When you're doing IVL at the, uh, in the LED, you're using the IVL balloon in the LED. Yeah. The calcification in the ostium of the diagonal also breaks down because yeah. the penetration of the yeah. IVL balloon is up to three yeah. to seven millimeter. Yeah. So many times we've seen that when you use the IVL balloon in the LED, the calcification in the ostium of the diagonal also breaks down at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Have you yeah. had such an experience? Uh, no, uh, not in this case. Exactly. I understood. Uh, the, the issue here was uh, the OCT catheter. It was a very tight lesion in the LED. So we actually, we wanted to image the LED. Uh, but since uh, the LED was, we were able to pass the balloon to the LED and dilate it without much of a problem. So uh, the plan was we didn't even consider IVL in this case. The only reason we thought of an IVL was that there is a big waste uh, when we used a, a balloon. You can see the waste in the balloon, the NC balloon. So, but if you could see, this was uh, uh, before the IVL and after the IVL. So you could after the IVL, clearly the waste uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, but uh, but this is uh, uh, the, your point is treating the LED whether it will. Uh, it will have an effect on the diagonal. But uh, if you want to uh, completely treat the lesion, it is good to have uh, a, a full uh, IVL in the diagonal. There are reports where they have done a kissing balloon of IVL with the two kissing uh, IVLs in the LED and the diagonal when you have a highly calcified bifurcation. But I am not aware that if there is a the, the, restric the lesion is restricted to one or two millimeters, the ostium of the diagonal, maybe it might work by treating the LED alone. And uh, um... So uh, you did a drug eluting balloon in the uh, diagonal and you stented the LED. Uh, so did you take an uh, imaging run into the diagonal to look for any presence we, of any dissection or anything? That's what I, I we didn't do uh, because uh, we didn't do imaging in this patient and the diagonal was not a great big vessel. So plan was just to allow, make the diagonal, uh, leave the diagonal open and nice. So uh, we didn't have plans to do imaging into the diagonal. Uh, but but uh, the, since angiographically it was a great result, if there's no dissection or a flap, we accepted it. And uh, the patient is doing very well now. It's almost six months since we did this case. We'll take uh, questions from our expert panel. Well, I was just going to ask Dr. the same question you asked there about imaging into the, the diagonal. And uh, you mentioned quite importantly there the importance of using uh, the dual reference as opposed to tapered reference for accessing your, your stent expansion. But that was a really lovely case and a, a great result. Congratulations. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Dr. Sengo, no. I just, uh, for my view, if you uh, encountered these kind of the uh, calcified lesion from the diagonal and diagonal is not big, I don't think if you put the wire and uh, do a provisional stenting like a lady, I, I don't think it will uh, compromise the circulation. Yeah, that's option. Actually, uh, actually if you have, and uh, see, the only point is if you put a stent and the diagonal closes, you have to forget about the diagonal. So the reason we treated the diagonal is to protect the diagonal in case uh, before stenting the lady. So if you don't have, do not have resources and ideal is not available, of course, uh, I would have done the same, leaving along the LA diagonal and putting the LED instead. One question that I have is that uh, one thing that has really bothered me at times is that the ideal is not available in sizes more than 3.5 to 4. So when you are dealing with a calcified lesion of the left main, and since the concept is that the ideal has to be size 1 is to 1, how effective 
put down 3.5 IVLB in a left main calcified so, lesion? Okay, that's a very, very important question. I think it, since we did imaging, we knew the size and we could take the 3.5 IVL. And in fact, we put a 3.5 stent as well. So, but if you do not have imaging, I think in left main, you need to have appropriately sized it. So I think that point is very important to size it one is to one. Otherwise, I will not have any effect at all. And another thing is that many a times when you have a long diffuse calcified lesion, the media is not visible on an OCT or an IVS. So appropriate sizing of that area is just not possible. So many a times you tend to undersize an IVL because when you're doing an imaging in a calcified lesion... Fine, you don't have to actually know the true vessel size. If you know the lumen diameter that is enough to size, size the IVL, there are two ways to do that. One, you can choose, look, at, look at the reference vessel diameter wherever it is, uh, you can measure it, either proximally or distally. Uh, second aspect is, for an IVL, it's important to have contact with the lesion. You don't, you don't have to go and oversize to the vessel size. So if you have a lumen diameter, that's more than enough to size the IVL. No, but many a times, you know, you have a lumen diameter which is really small, but then the media to media maybe at least maybe twice the lumen diameter. If you have a critical lesion, uh, as for example, in a in a three millimeter vessel, you have a very critical lesion, a two millimeter, even a two point five will will have an effect because you're going to oppose the vessel to the lumen. So it is not that you need to take a three millimeter vessel always, uh, I, I, because there are instances where there has been a negative remodeling, and if you oversize, you can even rupture the vessel. So to be cautious, it's always better to do not oversize if you are not having clearly knowing the vessel size. So it's better to go with the lumen size than oversizing the IVL. Yeah, and in case I of think that's negotiating an IVL, have you ever used graded sizes of IVL? Like, uh, of course, gauss is a big limitation, so I don't yeah. I've not used it, but. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's a unless uh, there are no limit, limitations of the cost. I don't think it's necessary. I think if you if you, you treat uh, with the si right size, I think you don't need to increase the size again. And you can use an OPN or IVL balloon, which will further help to expand the vessel. I think that's a very important point, which Dr. Sengutuvelu has said that you know, um, uh, not every time we have imaging, but it is important that we need to have contact with the vessel wall for the IVL to work. So if you've done a visual estimation and you achieve contact with the vessel wall, the IVL will work. So it's, uh, we don't ever oversize it. If at all, sometimes we undersize it. So uh, Dr. Sarita, with your permission, can I just make a comment? Please, please go ahead. So the, the, the second case of Dr. Singhatolu is, is really a very, very practical and uh, teaching case to us because we often come across the diagonals were sizable diagonal and we are unsure whether we will follow a two strength strategy or we want to just let it flow. And his strategy of uh, not using a cutting balloon here and going on to use an IVL and then a DEB uh, perhaps serves the purpose of ensuring that you don't end up putting another stent on the side branch. Uh, and as per the current EBC data also where the provisional approach is the way to go, I think this was a great demonstration of how you just use balloons and salvage your diagonal branches and just get away with a single stent across the main one. So great case, I must say. Absolutely. Yes, it's very it's interesting. Yeah, it was a very interesting approach, Dr. Singer, to will you, because of using the IVL, you had very uh, less amount of tissue trauma. So you could get away without putting a second stent. And uh, had you used a cutting or a spurring balloon, uh, there would have been tissue trauma. And then we would have been forced to use a two stent strategy. So that was a very interesting approach. I think Sengotuvel um, did a motherly attitude to the diagonal than a step motherly. <laughs> True. So uh, do we have any more comments from the expert panel or should we move uh, to our next uh, speaker? So we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. You. S. Manoj, and uh, he is going to be speaking about OCT guided PH oh, so modification Dr. using IVL in circumflex. I think the topic is a little interchange between the speakers. Uh, you could check on the agenda. So I'm, I'm talking on uh, when the going gets tough, how to get going. I hope you are able to see my slides in the presentation mode. Yes, we can see your slides. Uh, I can hear me as well. Yes, we can hear you. 
uh, thanks, um, uh, respected, uh, esteemed uh, moderator chair and my dear colleagues. Uh, it's interesting and uh, always uh, uh, a learning ability, not only for the presenter, but also for the listeners who uh, learn a lot from uh, each other's case and wonderful case being presented by uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Sengo Duvelo. So this is an elderly gentleman who presented with an ACS, NSTEMI, acute pulmonary edema and had a triple bifurcation, heavily calcified uh, critical coronary artery disease who required a chip PCI along with my co-consultant, Dr. Ananda Raman, presenting from Kaveri Hospital, Chennai. And uh, it's an 86-year-old doctor who is not practicing anymore, uh, developed uh, acute coronary syndrome, acute flash pulmonary edema, along with the angina. He's diabetic for 28 years, a non-smoker, hypertension, with a stage 3 CKD, GFR of 51 ml, and had an inferior wall MI about 12 years back, and an angiogram uh, done in the United States showed a chronic total occlusion of the right coronary artery and was kept on medical follow-up since then. And uh, presently he had an EF of 45% to 50% with a grade two mitral regurgitation, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension evident by the RV systolic pressure of 48, inferior wall segments were scarred, anterior wall, anterior septum, and mid anterior wall were hypokinetic with preserved thickness. He was initially managed because of these high risk, uh, uh, very elderly and frail conditions with medical management. However, it continued to experience uh, recurrent rest angina with breathlessness and hypoxia due to recurrent flash pulmonary edema. His RT uh, PCR for COVID-19 was uh, negative, and the angiogram uh, will be shown here, which showed a heavily dense calcium uh, involving the left main and all the three vessels. Uh, so chip PCI to the left main, LED diagonal, circumflex, and OM was planned. And uh, since RC was uh, uh, chronic totally occluded and the inferior wall segments were scarred, you no know, revascularization for the RCA-CTO was planned. I would deeply appreciate that uh, there is a, a, a very critical osteal eccentric plaque uh, and also the LED diagonal and the diagonal had a, an aneurysmal uh, with an ulcerated plaque here uh, and also an acute bend at the mid LED. And both the LED and the diagonal looked almost like a dual LED system and equally large vessels. And here you appreciate that there is a circumflex osteal disease and uh, mid-circumflex and eccentric uh, calcific disease and an OM, uh, uh, distal two OMs, which are equally large branches uh, with uh, true bifurcation stenosis. And uh, this is the RCA, which is a very small vessel and uh, was not um, intended to be revascularized. And these are some of the pictures so that uh, you would appreciate deeply that there is multiple calcified uh, um, vessel uh, lesions and plaques uh, causing critical coronary artery disease with left main osteal and LED diagonal and a distal circumflex and OM bifurcation uh, disease. So it's almost like a dual LED system. So we need to preserve both the vessels and the aneurysm and the uh, diagonal was adding complexity along with the angulation, which is appreciable here in this view, uh, in this projection, uh, uh, just at the osteum of the uh, diagonal. So the IVAS was done initially into the circumflex, which showed a eccentric calcific nodule in the mid-circumflex, and almost a 270-degree calcium was done. I didn't prefer an OCT because of uh, the need to use a contrast. I understand that the saline can be used for OCT imaging, but we had an IVAS and uh, thought it's a very safer procedure for uh, with the EGFR of uh, 50 or so. So the proximal circumflex had a fibrocalcific uh, disease, uh, and uh, the, there was a fibrous plaque in the ostium of the circumflex, uh, which can be uh, appreciated here with a significant burden. And the left main had an eccentric, almost uh, close to 180 degree calcified plaque. And uh, so we took a 7F um, uh, JL 3.5 guide catheter and a whisper extra support guide wire was used uh, through a transradial axis. And uh, uh, I did not pre-dilate, uh, I could get the IVL balloon, a three millimeter balloon uh, directly into the uh, distal uh, or mid circumflex. And also the proximal circumflex, uh, we delivered uh, IVL pulses using the same balloon. And the same balloon was once again used to deliver the IVL uh, shockwave pulses to the left main ostium. But at this time, uh, during the first cycle of left main ostium, the balloon had ruptured after uh, uh, the first cycle in the left main because of the eccentricity of the calcium plaque uh, causing. Uh, uh, rupture of the vessel. So these are the images, uh, check angiogram, which shows a significant luminal gain from this proximal circumflex to the uh, mid and uh, distal circumflex. Obviously, there is a significant residual disease in the 
of TUS marginal side branch, which is also a large vessel about 2.5. And uh, this image uh, is, uh, uh, shows that despite the IVL preparations and uh, adequate uh, luminal gain, uh, you would see that the uh, drug loading strand could not be delivered beyond the proximal circumflex. And this is despite a, a, a body wire, you could see there are two wires in the distal circumflex. So then use a three into six mm Wolverine cutting balloon without the, the left main calcified plug, which was not possibly modified by, by the IVL uh, balloon had ruptured then, and therefore of, uh, modifying the plug with a three into six mm Wolverine cutting balloon. And then subsequently a guide catheter assisted delivery and the guide extension catheter could get into the mid circumflex and you could see that easily the regular strands could be delivered with uh, additional support wire being also kept in the uh, distal uh, circumflex. And this allowed a deployment of a three into 28 mm regular loading stand in the mid to distal circumflex. And then the side branch was crossed into the OM and a three into 20 mm magic touch, which is a serolimus eluting balloon was used to deliver the drug into the side branch, much the same way uh, uh, single value had presented. Uh, but I did not modify the side branch. Uh, I used a, um, at a very low atmospheres uh, and you know that the drug loading balloon can be used at uh, six atmospheres uh, slowly without causing significant dissection. This was followed by kissing balloon dilatations in the circumflex and OM and uh, a part in the mid circumflex uh, which had the stent deployed there. And um, the eye was showed uh, a well-deployed um, uh, distal OM uh, and circumflex, mid-circumflex DES. You could appreciate the side branch here, which is uh, devoid of any flap, and there's a well-open side branch in the circumflex to OM bifurcation. And the proximal uh, uh, circumflex also showed a well-deployed uh, DES. Subsequent to that, uh, um, we wired the LED and the diagonal, and this is again by the two whisper wires. The, the LED wiring was very difficult, it took around 20 minutes. Uh, how most of the time the wire was going into the diagonal, uh, uh, which had a more uh, uh, biased alignment and um, there was an acute bend here. It did not allow uh, the heavily calcified uh, vessel in the LED and the plaque um, at the bifurcation did not allow any sorts of balloon to be crossing and uh, used 1.5 into 10, 1.2 into 8 mm. And this is a uh, one mm balloon, you could see a, a single marker doesn't allow to cross into the mid LED. And despite all these maneuvers um, with the heavy push and uh, advancement techniques, uh, uh, I could not, uh, I did not injure any of the vessels. So there was a patency of the uh, diagonal and the LED being maintained. And uh, then subsequently used a Nick Nano balloon. Again, the Nick Nano balloon you would appreciate did not cross the um, LED diagonal into the mid LED. And this was into the LED wire. And then, however, dilated, you could appreciate there is some dilatation using the Nick Nano balloon because we thought uh, this balloon would uh, anyway uh, be having used and does not cross, so would modify the proximal plug. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we have an impasse here uh, because uh, we're not able to modify the uh, LED and the diagonal. Um, I have some issue with the presentation. It's uh, just hanging on my system. So we have a impasse with the balloon non-crossability despite the two 014 guide wires. And um, maybe I'll just restart uh, and come back to you one minute. Uh, excuse me for that. So we're having a technical issue. If uh, it's on my system, I think it's on my system. So I've just uh, restarted. I'll start sharing now. So we have impasse of uh, balloon non-crossable lesions. Um, so where uh, we have various uh, methods by approaching this using a small balloon, we've used the smallest balloon of 0.85 and uh, balloon wedging and granuloplasty was done with the rupture. We didn't rupture the, um, um, the Nick Nano balloon. And then increase the support. We had uh, even um, guide extension catheter inside the main guide wire and you had two wires uh, to increase the support level. 
and uh, microcatheter can be used. Uh, you can use the uh, hard end of the wire to puncture through the, uh, the densely calcified eccentric plug, but that's a very, very injurious method. And then use a laser or atherectomy uh, devices. And uh, finally, you can use a subintimal technique to cross into the distal vessel uh, using a distal anchor technique. So there are multiple ways that you could do and about nine combinations of techniques can be used. We had an, uh, um, uh, we, we had a- Dr. Manoj, uh, uh, could you put it in slideshow, please? It is on slideshow on my system. Okay, we can't see it on slideshow in our- Okay, maybe I'll share it again. I'm sorry about that. Are you able to see it now? Uh, still not on slideshow, but we'll continue. No problem. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So, so we had a uh, um, uh, laser um, Elka with us. So you would certainly appreciate that uh, the uncrossable lesions is one of the indications of using the laser. And if you have an underexpanded stent or CTO, you can use a 0.9 mm catheters for any other uh, um, uh, instant restenosis secure MI with a large thrombus burn and venous graft. You can increase the size of the laser catheter to large levels. So we used a 0.9 mm uh, um, ELCA catheter, which is a 6F compatible, but the, our guide was 7F compatible. And therefore, uh, you will see that uh, the differences of using an ELCA and uh, rotablation is that it can be used over the routine coronary guide wire. Since we had a difficulty in crossing into the LAD because I could bend and time bifurcation, we had two. 014 wire, we thought of using this uh, without uh, switching over to the wire. And you can use a cell line, which is a very friendly for uh, patients with CKD and does indicated and moderately calcified, even though it was uh, uh, densely calcified. So if you have a rotablation, you need a de dedicated rotor wire and it can be used only if the wires can be switched. I wasn't certain whether I would be able to cross with the rotor floppy wire uh, because of the acute uh, difficulty that I experienced. And it's a very well indicated in heavily calcified lesions like this. So we used a 0.9 mm, uh, mm uh, catheter, uh, and uh, we would know that even if um, uh, the laser does not cross the lesion, the plug gets modified. And that's how the studies have shown, and you don't have to change the wire. So if you have uh, this facility and 014 wires crossed, you could perhaps try in balloon non-crossable lesions. So this is the spectranetics uh, exam and laser in our uh, cath lab. Uh, which is there always. Dr. Manoj, your slides are not changing. Oh, I'm, I don't know why. Uh, Dr. Manoj, just press escape and then uh, you can change the slides. No, I'm doing that. Um, yeah, just, I'm stopped yes, sharing it has and just I, changed. I, I, has no, it changed now? Change yeah, you yes, can change it has this, changed you now. You can uh, run it in this mode only, sir. Don't put it in presentation mode. Oh, is it so? Okay. All right. So uh, we used a um, uh, 0.9 mm uh, um, catheter uh, for delivering the laser uh, pulses at uh, 40 uh, into 30 and 45 into 45 uh, and for 60 joules into 45 and 80 into 60 um, uh, frequencies. And these are the frequency cycles. So we exhausted almost uh, uh, the full uh, available strengths of the um, optimal op optical energy using the laser. And uh, hardly we could uh, make out any kind of uh, progress uh, with the laser and there was no further uh, improvement in the luminal gain despite 45 minutes of delivery of the ELCA catheter. So it was getting tougher and tougher and uh, it's left with only option of rotational atherectomy, understanding the difficult wiring and the significant wire bias. So I'm not sure whether you'll be able to appreciate on this mode, but uh, this is a micro catheter there. And uh, once uh, the, um, I'm, I'm sorry again. So once the uh, uh, 014 wire is removed, the microcatheter gets deflected into the diagonal. So there is a bias towards the diagonal, which is a more straightened course than uh, getting into the LED. So it was very difficult to um, wire the uh, rotor floppy wire, but it took almost uh, 40, 45 minutes. And uh, with an acute curve bend at the tip, you would find that uh, with the support of the uh, microcatheter, I could wire into the uh, LED um, after a long, long perseverance, and then used um, uh, 1.25 at the rotor bar at 160 RPM, which did not cross through that. And there was a sustained requirement of uh, burring. And you will see with the sustained burring, 
uh, it did um, make a progress and uh, cut through the calcified plaque into the uh, mid LED. Um, I once again apologize for this, uh, unable to share it on a screen playing. And, and the check angiogram after the rotablation showed uh, no dissection and the neurism in the side branch remained the same and there was a, a better flow in the digital LED. And this was followed by an IVAS and the IVAS um, did show a circumferential calcification in the mid LED and the reverberation of the calcium uh, post rotablation sometimes is described indicating a dense uh, and deep calcium. So this was followed by switching off the wire over the microcatheter uh, in, uh, to a regular workhorse wire, uh, 014 and a 2.5 into a 12 mm shockwave IVL was delivered into the mid LED and also the proximal LED. Uh, and uh, then this was uh, a check angiogram post IVL showed almost a stent like result. So you get a very, very significant luminal gain without much of dissection flap or uh, uh, vessel trauma with the IVL uh, balloon. And that's the uh, significant advantage of using the shockwave in these kind of the, uh, plots. And this was followed by a three into 28 mm uh, drug looting stent. And post uh, DES implant, you would see that uh, uh, the, IV, uh, the IVAS showed a well deployed uh, DES and well expanded uh, uh, DES in the LED. And uh, subsequently, we did. Uh, uh, Quiller technique of left main um, uh, into the circumflex uh, overlapping up to the mid circumflex and then uh, left main into the LED uh, a kissing balloon and a pot for the left main uh, with a, a six mm balloon. Um, and um, you, you would see that um, the uh, optimal results uh, were obtained and the side branch into the diagonal did maintain without much of uh, uh, significant morphological um, disturbances to the aneurysm, which is the weakest portion of the vessel. So here you would see that the final check angiogram shows a, a, a well-optimized left main circumflex LED and the diagonal is well preserved and flowing well. So my final slide and conclusion is that a chip toolbox should be comprehensive enough to envisage all possible significant challenges that could be met with in a densely calcified uh, critical coronary disease during a revascularization in a complex patient who needs uh, an indication for revascularization. So the case presented illustrates an appropriate uh, um, utility of the newer technologies, uh, IV lithotripsy, the drug-coated balloon, especially the serolimus drug-coated balloon, which is available in our country, Wolverine cutting balloon, the laser uh, LCA catheters, and also the image-guided and uh, directed interventional therapies, a uh, rotablation for a successful procedural outcome. ELCA can be, have a limitation in a densely calcified long lesions. However, it is understood that the ELCA does modify the plaque even if there's a failure for the ELCA catheter to cross the lesion. Rotablation is an, indeed an effective tool in a chip toolkit for making way in a non-crossable lesions. And IVL is the most useful among the chip tool in many of these calcified case instances of densely calcified lesions. And it's very user-friendly to even a beginner to use a, intravascular lithotripsy with the shockwave uh, balloon. Of course, in this patient, uh, it's an additional MCS uh, mechanical circulatory support would be welcome, but this patient was being closely monitored uh, by the cardiac anesthetist and critical team and he remained hemodynamically stable. We just maintain an access in case uh, he requires uh, any kind of mechanical circulatory support. My apologies for not uh, being able to present in the slide presentation mode. And thanks for the opportunity to share this uh, complex coronary intervention. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. That was indeed a very challenging case and handled very well. And an excellent uh, demonstration of how we need, uh, many a times we need all the modalities to deal with challenging cases such as this. Uh, it was very important that you highlighted some very important points about shockwave, about its safety and its ease of use. Uh, with the minimal soft tissue trauma because uh, of it doesn't have any effect on any tissue which has a similar acoustic impedance. And uh, the reason that it affects selectively the calcium is because of its differing acoustic impedance. So that's how safe it is. And the ease of use because it can be used even by beginners. So it's a very effective tool, but very challengingly a uh, case, very well handled, excellent demonstration. We'll take uh, comments from our expert uh, 
panel. Dr. Yes. Manoj, uh, yeah, Dr. Manoj. Think, uh, yes, Dr. Watkins, please. No, I was just saying it was excellent. Um, how long did it take to do the case? Well, uh, certainly, yes. I suppose it took around six hours. Wow. Operator fatigue. I think in those circumstances, it's Definitely. quite good to have a second consultant operator helping you for such a complex anatomy. But, yeah, yeah we up. take, uh, in such cases, anticipation with two experienced operators uh, exchanging hands and uh, because you need uh, different uh, operators for the wiring's uh, expertise, uh, because wiring is a very, very crucial aspect uh, before delivering any other uh, devices. Yeah, we found that, that doubling up, having two complex uh, operators doing these cases is good for, good for operator fatigue and good for the patient. I think you get better outcomes when you've got two of you working on something so difficult. Another important aspect of the IVL shockwave and the bifurcation is that as you treat the main vessel uh, with a shockwave, I hardly find there's a plaque shifting uh, into the side branch. So the side branch is almost always well preserved and it's a very vessel friendly uh, technology and it's going to stay for a long, long time. And it will be very useful for many such patients where you may have to preserve the side branch then in case you're considering uh, provisional stenting. Dr. Manoj, uh, after 1.25 rota, uh, it was in your mind that you can, uh, why don't you upgrade the 1.5 rota bar to besides using this IVL balloon? So why you, uh, you saw the, there was a circumferential calcium and uh, we certainly know now the rotablation um, modifies only the superficial plaque. And uh, the whole vessel looked uh, intensely and densely calcified. So even if you upgrade the vessel, the lumen may uh, uh, gain in size, but the vessel compliance would not be significantly changed. And then you may have to go to very high pressure for <laughs> deployment of the stents. You may have to use the uh, high pressure balloons to optimize the stent results. Whereas um, if you use the shock wave, you don't have to um, deploy the stents at uh, beyond nominal uh, levels, because there is a transmural vessel complex and change. And um, that makes it very effective for stent to be delivered. Even long stents can be can deliver uh, uh, long length stents and can be deployed easily uh, at uh, nominal pressures. Excellent case, uh, Dr. Manoj. Uh, Thank you. Uh, was uh, difficult wiring the only reason you chose uh, Elka over Rota up front? Yes. And uh, since it was available with us, uh, uh, since we don't have to exchange and switch five minutes for wiring into the middle area across the diagonal. So we thought I was sure whether I would be able to um, get the, uh, the field, the tapering tip of uh, 009. And we know that uh, the rotor wire has the tip of 014. So um, the tapering tip uh, hydrophilic uh, fielder XT could negotiate um, uh, the calcified bifurcation. No other um, workhouse wire could get across. So we had used almost uh, 11 wires uh, in the whole. So um, just for the sake of uh, interest, uh, Dr. Manoj, uh, when you do your IVL cases, um, how frequently do you come across uh, shock topics? And have you had any patient who's had a VT or a VS? Yeah, it's very common to see, I would say uh, in about 50% of the patients, uh, even if you use a peripheral IVL, I've used peripheral IVL since the Clavian Iota Iliac and also in Iota uh, away from the heart. And you do get uh, shock atopics uh, because the shock gets transmitted through the body tissues, uh, not necessarily from, uh, directly. But uh, I've not come across any patients, even though there is a very rare few cases reported of uh, uh, R on tree phenomenon, and that's a potential. Uh, 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 downside of that, but it's very, very rare. 
true. And even in that uh, isolated case report, which they have that, you know, uh, the, they were doing shockwave and the patient had a VTVF episode, it was postulated that it could be because of the ischemia, which was produced by the inflation of the balloon per se in an uh, ischemic myocardium. And also that possibly the patient had a baseline predisposition to ventricular ectopy, which was precipitated by the ischemic myocardium. So that they were not really sure whether it was a coincidental finding or not. Uh, do we have any other um, expert comments or should we move on to our next speaker? If I can make a last uh, comment, uh, the one of the downside of IVL, I would say, is that it's got a very long dwelling time, uh, about 10 seconds. Uh, it's a very slow delivery. Each second, each pulse is delivered. So it's got a long dwelling time. So if you have a circulatory or hemodynamic uh, disturbances, you would always need a circulatory support especially when you're dealing with the left main, because in left main, if you're using a non-shockwave uh, regular NC balloons, you just go up on the pressure dilatation and then deflate uh, within about two, three seconds. So a short inflation technique uh, is not possible in uh, IVL. So you will have to really watch this hemodynamics and um, see whether circulatory support has to be required in uh, many of such uh, complex chip cases. Dr. Manoj, uh, just uh, for that, uh, actually, whenever we are doing left main, and uh, I frequently use IVL in a left main situation, and what we've seen is that uh, these are usually chronically stenotic lesions, and uh, the myocardium is actually quite accustomed to dealing with the amount of ischemia. So they usually tolerate the procedure well. The second thing is that at any time, you can deflate your IVL balloon. You can Many of the operators, when they're doing left main and they have a significant drop of pressure, they go down at five pulses. So, which is why in left main it has become uh, so, and of course, the advantage of always having two wires in. So, which is why in left main, IVL has become very popular because True. you can get it down at five pulses, and usually they tolerate the ischemia very well. Uh, yeah, so we, I think it's a good point. Yes. So, uh, We'll move to our next uh, speaker, and that is, uh, we'd like to invite Dr. P.K. Sahu. He would be talking about underexpanded stent managed using IVL. Uh, good evening, Chairperson, Madam, and uh, respected uh, guest faculty. In fact, uh, there is some problem with the topics being announced. This is just my topic is an OCT guided plaque modification using IVL. Now in the circumflex territory, in fact, this is nothing exotic as Dr. Singhatafalu or Dr. Manoj has shown, but this is more of a just a teaching case. In fact, uh, if you try to compare the coordinate versus an OCT, because as uh, Dr. Purva had said, that we should all think of doing the OCT prior to planning our case. Now, calcium protection is with the tune of 73% versus a coordinate angiogram. And we can, all, of course, do a, a find out whether it's a nodular calcium, superficial calcium, or a deep calcium, and also do the calcium score, which is not possible in a coordinate angiogram. So this gentleman is a, a diabetic hypertensive dyslipidemic with a history of chronic stable angina, NYH2. The resting ECG was normal. He had undergone a treadmill, which was positive at stage three. An angio was done, in fact, at a single vessel disease. The LED was calcific, but had a non-significant lesion. The L6 was calcifying, not only calcified, it was very ectactic and also has had significant lesions. And the RCA was normal. So the first strategy was to image guide uh, the PC, LCX and then plan the this thing procedure. This is just the LED where you can see there is there are chunks of calcium, there is some minor blocks, and uh, we were not much worried about the LED. But if you see the SARC, when it has areas of uh, ectasia, areas of calcification, which are present, and the normal angio on the angiogram, uh, this thing, fluoroscope, you can see it is a dense calcium, also, almost like a tram track calcium. So, so it was decided that we would first be uh, going ahead with doing an OCT of this thing, the uh, CERT. So an OCT was done and the OCT revealed a very uh, tight lesions at two places along with some amount of ectasia in some places. 
So this is the OCT place and you can see some calcium spurs also at times and some dense uh, deep calcium, some superficial calcium and at places where it was extremely constricted. So this, see all these things, we, you can see the dense calcium over here. So what was the plan was to go ahead and see what was the, uh, if you try to analyze uh, OCT pictures, it was like this. You can see areas of 1.01 .01 and the distal and the normal areas of the 5.36 and 7.02. So we decided why should we do for, go for an intravascular lithotripsy in this case? So if you go for calcium scoring in this patient, you'll be seeing that the arc of the calcium is almost more than 180. It is the depth of the calcium is more than uh, 0.5 millimeter. And of course, you see the length is also more than 5 millimeter. So if you do a calcium scoring in this particular case, if you give it a point, it comes to a score of 4. So once if you go to the algorithm of what should be most ideal in such a case, at most, if you see that the algorithm clearly says that the patient has got moderate to severe calcium. And once you do a calcium scoring, either by the IVUS or an OCT, and if you have a three to five points, possibly lithotripsy is the first uh, this thing choice. And if a lithotripsy does not cross, then you have to use a rota ablation followed by a lithotripsy. This should be something which has to be remembered. And based on this algorithm, my plan was to go with a lithotripsy. Now, this is the uh, lithotripsy balloon, which was to be easily crossed. And in fact, a four into 12 uh, IVIL balloon is used. And I had to, it was quite a long lesion, and I had to give multiple pulses. I was exhausted the whole thing. And uh, because as was being said previously by uh, the thing that how frequently we get socks, it is uh, my routine practice to put the defibrillator pads. You can see the defibrillator pads over here. And uh, routinely I do that because in fact, uh, we have seen patients uh, having short runs of VT means non-sustained DT, and you can prevent it if you can put this deep through the pads and go ahead with the case. So after this uh, IVL was used, you can see that uh, there was a good amount of dissection that had occurred in this case. Then a post-IVL OCT is extremely essential to make you understand how effective it has been or whether you'd like to, again, still further dilate with a OPN or just a plain NC. But uh, in this case, as you see, they can see not only chunks of uh, uh, this thing, calcium being broken, but also some superficial calcium also uh, having areas which are denuded in these places. And if you see the calcium fractures are very clearly visible, and you can see the area has already increased almost to 7.1 from 1.0. And you can see the calcium fractures very clearly in this case. So this shows that definitely the IVL balloon had done its job. Not only had it fractured the calcium, it had also increased the lumen to some extent. So it was now time that we go ahead and just stent it. So it was a 32 millimeter synergy stent that was used. And uh, the synergy stent was uh, this thing put at uh, uh, this thing that is nominal. Then it was post dilated. And this was the final results after post dilated to the 4 into 12 sapphire balloon. So you can see that. And uh, th th this was the final result. But you see the circumflex was a very big vessel. And uh, after the use of the eye wheel and putting the stent, there was almost uh, the results was extremely good. So this is just to compare the pre and the post. You can see the calcific pre lesion and the post lesion, which was extremely good. So this is the beauty of IVL that uh, one should two or three things that I would like to convey is that one should always do a pre-imaging so that you can size your uh, IVL balloon and then try to do a good post-imaging or an imaging once a second imaging in between before stenting so that you know that the IVL balloon has worked and then finally after stenting do an, again a an final imaging to see that there has been good apposition and good expansion. And this uh, run of the OCT will show you that the stent has expanded well and the artery has opened quite nicely, excepting at some areas there's a little bit of eccentricity. But if you see the M mode, it clearly shows that there has been a good expansion. 
So not only expansion, but even the opposition is very essential. And you can see the areas that we could get up to 12, 13 millimeter, which was hardly around one millimeter when we started off it. And the opposition is also very important to be appreciated, not only the expansion, and this is what imaging will show you. So as you say, when you don't see what can lead you to disaster, imaging always is very important and OCT helps in managing this calcified lesions in a very calculated manner. So are doing a pre-imaging, doing a intermediate imaging and doing a final imaging definitely helps you in the long run. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Sahu. That was a very uh, well done case and excellent use of IVL for a very good result. And uh, it's interesting that you use uh, uh, defibrillator pads. Uh, so have you had experiences of the patient having the uh, runs of OVT? Uh, we have had non-sustained VT very frequently, but we never had to defibrillate it. But still then at the back of your mind, you always have it that supposing the patient has a VT, there's always a chaos situation in the cath lab. So better to keep the defibrillator pads and work on it. That is what is my the, my way of going ahead. Actually, what they have uh, you know, uh, looked at is that uh, the amount of mechanical energy that you give when you're using IVL is actually only about eight microjoules. And even when we do a VF induction, when we are uh, implanting an AICD, the minimum amount of energy required is 0.62 joules. So usually it doesn't happen. Sure. But it was a very well uh, done case. It's an excellent result, Dr. Sahu. Uh, over to the expert panel for uh, expert comments, Dr. Watkins. Yeah, it really was a lovely case and uh, a really nice result. Did you protect the obtuse marginal branches that came off there? No, no, we didn't protect the marginal branches. There was hardly any marginal over there. The small twig there was there. So we were not very keen on protecting that. Sure. Nice result. Dr. Yes. Hello. Please go ahead. Yeah, well, sorry. Yeah. Just a question that I will being quite expensive. Now you get a high calcium score like the one in your case. Yes. Uh, what is the downside of reaching for a slightly undersized cutting balloon or an OPN first and trying that before going to IVL? Especially if the patient is just not simply very easily affording that much cost because in our uh, country, it's always out of pocket expense. So what is the downside? Is there any downside? There is no downside, but uh, we are not very sure that we can experiments do a good bed preparation using the this thing, cutting balloon alone. And in fact, these are lesions where there are areas of fibrosis, calcium, ectasia. So one has to be very careful in using these cutting balloons. In the ectactic portions, there are areas that you can you can cause a rupture by using a cutting balloon. And in these cases, in fact, IVL is much safer. Secondly, if you go by the calcium scoring, uh, you'll see that I'm very justified in choosing this modality. It is a non-cross, it is a crossable lesion with a score of four. So definitely I'll go with an IVL and outright with an IVL without doing any other preparation. Absolutely. So I think the degree of safety is what uh, Dr. Sahu is talking about. Uh, with the cutting balloon, uh, we would have significantly more amount of vessel trauma. And that there's been a study in which they've compared the cutting balloon versus the IVL with significantly better results with the IVL. Yeah, but till I not too long back, we were using rota up front with maybe a cutting balloon and a high pressure balloon to get these results. I mean, uh, now that we have OCT and we have uh, calcium uh, distribution uh, morphology available to our uh, to us to decide on the uh, device strategy, but uh, good old days or not even too long back, I think rotablation with a good uh, bed preparation with rota followed by the use of NC balloons and cutting balloons would do the job major majority of the times. Uh, Absolutely, I agree. Dr. Pudi, it I does, feel... but yes, I think yes. uh, that's the importance of technology, how it I, I know, helps I know, us certainly. and how it 
Rota, Rota use, needs a different skill set. Uh, that's also an issue with Rota, uh, vis a vis uh, the decision and the technique to use an IVL. And especially when you have such large vessels, I think uh, you do not have uh, large bursts to use. So you go on upgrading bursts, then these balloons are much user friendly rather than uh, using our Rota. And secondly, we have to change with technology because we are more going by evidence based medicine. Did you decide to uh, open the side branch, Dr. Sahu, OM? Uh, which I no, 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 no. Uh, I, I, I didn't change that. I didn't change All right. That. I think that's another very important point because uh, earlier, especially in we had large vessel sizes, 3.54, and uh, we were unable to modify that with uh, the rota ablation. And especially for large vessel sizes, I will work extremely well. Frequently, after doing rota, I've got stuck in large vessels, especially in large RCAs. Uh, we didn't have enough uh, flake modification. We didn't have enough calcium breakage and frequently ran into underexpanded stents. And that has really uh, paved the way with IVL, with these larger IVL balloons, it breaks down the calcium in the large vessels. We'll uh, go to our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Sahu. Uh, We'd like to invite Dr. Subhash Chandra, who's going to be presenting under expanded stent management using IVL. Thanks, Dr. Sarita. I hope my slides are visible. Your slides are visible and you're audible. All right. So that's in presentation mode. So this is the last presentation after having heard so much from the very astute and experienced operators. And Dr. Watkins shows showed some of the very nice cases in his presentation where one of them was unexpended stent also. So since IVL has come a long way now in our practice with this recent approval in US FDA also, and they have launched a new balloon, which is less susceptible to ruptures, which was the case with the previous generation. Uh, these situations are not uncommon in our practice, which I show here, that in spite of having done your best and having best tools used, you still end up having a constrained balloon and the, and, the, and the lesion would not just give way. So the calcification of coronaries is a common cause for stent under expansion associated with increased risk of stent thrombosis and resnosis. And the present devices for treatment of such cases because of severe calcium or the boulders of calcium as nodular calcium are the rotational atherectomies or high pressure non-compliant balloons with limitations of potential balloon rupture and perforation is a perpetual risk. So the tools which we have at our disposal are the cutting balloons, scoring balloons, and now Wolverine or Ingus sculpts, uh, atherectomy devices, both rotablation and orbital atherectomy. And now, of course, the IVL has emerged as one of the very important tools to deal with such problems, though off-shelf indication but it has been shown in various series and small series that it does work. And of course, examined laser, which one of our colleagues had shown, uh, most of us have, don't have an access to it. And of course, opium balloon is a high pressure balloon, which grows up to 45, 50 atmosphere. And it, it does a lot of uh, efficacious justice to such cases. Nevertheless, in the armamentarium, we should have all the tools as was shown in uh, Dr. Uh, one of the presentations that we should have guide supports, you have should long sheaths, guide liners to deploy those stents in distant locations, and of course, body wires, body balloons, etc. So coming to you know, this case, where I would just show the flip side of uh, ending up in non-expanded stent. This was a case, uh, the lesion looked pristine, and uh, short of imaging, we had no clue that what we're dealing with, is it a soft lesion or a fibrotic lesion? So again, I highlight the importance of doing imaging in such cases, uh, which is not the case in majority of uh, contemporary interventions. Having done that with a half-hearted balloon dilatation and uh, giving soft feel of this lesion, the stent was deployed up front. The stent expanded well, except for constraint at one portion, which was dealt with a non-compliant balloon at high pressure, and the constraint is still persist. And uh, at the end of it, what we see is this. So this is not an uncommon scenario when we end up having perforations in an attempt to uh, deploy a stance properly. Uh, well, this was salvaged quickly with some balloon tamponade. And 
the maxim is that once you are done with the post dilatation, you should not pull out your balloon. You keep it in the guiding catheter so, so that in an event of perforation, you can quickly push in until the time you're preparing your other stuff to seal it off. Uh, you can always get away without doing pericardial changes. Well, pericardial changes was required in this case, as you see a pigtail here lying here, because the patient immediately crashed after such a, a grade three perforation. And having done that, a covered stent was taken, which was deployed in time, and the situation was salvaged here. And you see the constraint is still persist at one point. So uh, another case where uh, the intervention was started without doing a proper imaging here in golden good old days, uh, well, the stent was deployed, but it perforated in the process of post dilatation. Uh, we ended up putting a covered stent here quickly. Uh, this case fortunately didn't require any pericardial synthesis, but after the first covered stent, the perforation still persisted. So another covered stent was taken here. And uh, this case, the balloon of this covered stent would not come out in spite of pulling it out and was case had eventually to be shifted for bypass surgery and the salvage. So such are the scenario if you are not able to deal with the, the, the constrained vessels with proper tools. So I show a case here, which is a 75 year old male, which is a post bypass 13 years back. He underwent uh, angioplasty to LED two years back, or now two and a half years back in some other city where rotablation was used because of heavy calcium. They ended up having an underexpanded stent at the proximal LED. And uh, despite high pressure balloon inflation, that portion was constrained. And this operator, which was a very aggressive rotablation use operator, uh, was scared of using the rotablation inside the stent for its own flip side, that the, the use of rotablation under, inside the stent would always cause some kind of embolization or stent embolizing distal circulation or burr entrapment. And those are the, the, the fears of using rotablation inside a stent. So the case presented to us with the exertional angina and on angiogram, we saw that there's a constrained end of the proximal end of LED stent. Uh, well, opian balloon was used for this, rightly so at 45 atmosphere, but that even failed to open the constrained stent. Uh, imaging runs were captured with an IVS, which revealed that there was a thick arc of calcium and there was a nodule also, uh, which is extending almost at 180 around the stent. And that was the cause that the stent was not giving way and uh, the improper expansion was there. So I will balloon was utilized to, to take care of this part and I'll show you how we did this. So this was the case. And as you see here, there is a constrained part of the stent at the proximal end and the calcium was visible all along this vessel. It is also seen in the areocranial view here that we have a constrained stand here. So the, the IVS runs would look something like this. There's a napkin ring calcification at that particular point, which was not uh, allowing us to open it even with an opian balloon used at 45 atmosphere, as in this case. And you see the balloon opian is also constrained here because this calcium, napkin calcium will not allow it to expand. So then we chose a 3.5, 12 uh, IVL balloon uh, which has been seen here giving nicely uh, the way as you see in this case. The balloon starts expanding as you close, you observe it at the end of few pulses. And this was effective. Having done that, <clears throat> the stent had nicely opened here. Uh, we were thinking whether to put another stent here or not or at least use a DEB here. And those questions were debated amongst us, but eventually we decided to leave it alone because the expansion was very nice. And uh, this is how it looked on the stand boost. The stand was nicely expanded here. So there was, uh, there it was left like this. And that's the pre and that's the post where the stand has nicely opened and the lesion looks nice. Some people advocate to use cutting balloons here, but that too has a flip side that the blades of these cutting balloons sometimes can get fractured or entrapped in the stent. 
and uh, there could be in the entrapment of the balloon in such cases and uh, therefore those are not uh, a good choice to be used in such unexpanded stents and this is how it was seen here there's an arc of this is not the, the same case but the other cases which i looked up in literature have shown that after having done the IVL, you can clearly show the fractures in these napkin ring calcium, calcium of these vessels. So the points in my presentation of the fibrotic and calcific lesions are largely responsible for failed stent expansion. Therefore, imaging has an important role to play before you decide about the strategy. Angiography may miss as uh, the previous speaker showed or Sahu showed that the angiography picks up just about 37% of calcium, which increases to 75% if we use OCT or IVS. The imaging is extremely important tool to plan your strategy. Cutting balloon, rotablation, OP and high pressure balloons are the tools to ensure full expansion of the stents. But in a case where a stent has already been placed uh, and both these tools have uh, their flip side, uh, one only resorts to use IVL and it is emerging as an important off-shelf use of this technique in dealing with the non-expanded stents, as was shown in my case. I recently came across one series of 13 cases uh, from one of the centers, and the IVL has worked excellent in, in such cases of unexpanded expanded stents. So we need more safety and the long-term follow-up of these cases before we take it up in our routine practice to deal with these unexpanded cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, we've come full circle because I think in the first presentation, we were discussing about uh, whether we can use IVL inside under expanded stents. And it's true that it's an off-label indication, with, but with the emergent use of it for under expanded stents, I believe soon it will become an on-label indication. The concern is usually that it might damage the polymer of the stent. But I think so far it's been able to do a very good job. And also uh, you've very nicely elucidated about the results of uh, barotrauma, which can occur because of the high pressure, which we've been using frequently and how IVL has helped us in such situations. Can we have some uh, comments from our expert panel, please? Chandra, just one question. Uh, how do you decide how many pulses you'll give in such cases? Do you decide, okay. is there any criteria just on the shape of the balloon that we take it? Uh, I think we, uh, today we largely go by uh, looking at carefully at the shape of the balloon. Uh, the, the, the moment the waist is expanded, uh, we go on to the other lesion. If we are dealing with a diffuse calcified lesion and then try to exhaust most of these available pulses on different sides. We got to be very careful about uh, knowing the fact that the, the exact pulses of uh, the IVL are not right in the center of the balloon. They are located a little proximal to the distal tip of uh, the balloon. So that has to be aligned to the, 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 the dense calcium, and that is how it works best. I think that's very important, the emitter uh, positioning. So the maximum effect is if you position at the dense the densest calcification, you need to position your emitters. That is where the uh, pulses work maximally. So it's important to do that. Right. The other thing is that the apposition with the site is very, very important. And therefore, uh, Dr. Watkins in his presentation showed that in his cases, he was using it almost 50% of the times. But I would urge that uh, we should try to do a pre dilatation with the balloon uh, and then size it if you have imaging done of this vessel and then choose the proper sized balloon and make sure that the balloon approximates, the emitters approximate nicely with the vessel wall so as to make it efficacious. And, and you escape uh, rupturing your IVL balloon also in that process. That was a beautiful cases, uh, Dr. Chandra. Thanks very much for, for sharing those. Can I just ask you, uh, if you do use IVL within a stent, and you know, Dr. Rao just alluded to the fact that there's some nice electron micro, mic, microscopy images of damage to the polymer of a polymer coated drug eluting stents, would you then place another stent within the stent, or would you use a drug eluting balloon within the stent once you've used IVL? What, what, what's your practice? So that's a very good question, Watkins, regarding my case. Yes, if it is being used. Uh, a, on a setting where a, a fresh stent has been deployed 
And Dr. Sarita also pointed out, you're perpetually worried that you are denuding the polymer, which could lead to the long-term consequences. And it's always a good idea maybe to pick up another stent or at least a regulating balloon. But in my case, the stent was two, two and a two and a half years old. And perhaps by that time, mm, uh, the drug has gone, it has worked. Uh, it was just the polymer which was there. And now polymer has no role to play in this particular case. So at the end of the case, we're still debating whether to, 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 to touch it with a DEB or put another stent here. Uh, but given the background, we decided that to, to leave it alone and, uh, and see that how this patient behaves in future. And in case there's a need, we can always go back and put another stent there. Thank you. Dr. Watkins, uh, just as a matter of interest, um, uh, have you, uh, you know, tried using the peripheral shockwave balloon ever in the coronaries? No, I've not used the peripheral balloon in, in coronaries, no, just in the iliacs for, for TAVI sheath delivery. Okay, because we are always limited by two things in IVL, is that the number of pulses are limited and the length of the balloon is also limited. So uh, looking at that, I recently came across an operator who tried a peripheral balloon in the coronary. Uh, we have come across some of the presentations where because of the size of a peripheral vessel, uh, people have parked an ordinary balloon by the side of five wheel balloon so as to approximate those emitters with the wall and then rotate in a different direction and could finish the task. Uh, where the proper sized balloon in the descending aorta or in large artery was not available. So that could be one of the level uh, use of this balloon. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarita probably must be asking because the peripheral IVL balloon comes from 3.5 4, 4.5, 5.5, 6.5 up to 7. And they are 70 uh, uh, millimeters. So I, I'm not sure whether we can use that in some of the long lesions uh, because they are comparable with 6F uh, and 7F catheters. They also have an S4. Now the S4 comes at only a 40 millimeter size. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's 40 and um, 2.5 to 4. So we were contemplating whether, you know, we could use that in the coronaries because Frequently, you used up your 80 pulses, and then that gives you up to 160 pulses. So yeah. frequently, we use up our 80 pulses, and the lesion is still not done. Then we need more armamentarium, because all said and done, India is a country where cost is very important to us. Yeah, I think that's the issue, isn't it? They are quite long. You know, they're all 60 millimeters. I mean, they're six French compatible up to the center and uh, short wave balloon and you get 180 pulses. So um, I've, never, I've never had to use it, but you know, my slight concern is that when it's 60 millimeters, it may be too long, but um, certainly only the 6.5 and the seven millimeter short wave balloons, you need a seven French delivery system. So Dr. Afur, Dr. Saurabh, Dr. Raj Shekhar, would you like to add uh, something? I mean, I was just thinking, what if the ideal balloon, instead of being on a semi-compliant balloon, would have been on a non-compliant balloon? You know, it would have served the dual purpose of delivering the shock, as well as the same balloon could, could have been used for pre-dilating the lesion once the shock waves have been delivered. So it would have served the dual purpose of acting as a non-compliant as well as a shock wave balloon thereafter. It's just that I think they're working on the. Uh, I think, I think they're working. Yeah, they're working on it, and I guess there must be just issues on trackability once you mount it on I a non-compliant balloon. They're also coming in, I think, with the twin layer technology for the IVL balloon, just mm -hmm. as we have in an open and So, and that's probably because of the you know couple of incidences of operations which we've had, um, ruptures which we've had. I think they're working on the balloon and soon they're going to come in with a new uh, design. So the indications of IBL balloon are gradually expanding from coronaries to peripheral. And now even in, in our country where we have rheumatic calcific mitral stenosis, which is very common. So there are case reports wherein for mitral annular calcification, people in the West have used...
double uh, uh, IVL balloons to break the calcium and to achieve a percutaneous therapeutic option for calcific uh, mitral valve stenosis. And probably in the near future, with Tavi having been uh, the game changer for percutaneous treatment for aortic valve uh, replacement, I guess probably IVL may have a role there as well. Yes, it's, I think a lot of expanding indications of this uh, therapy are now coming in. So I think uh, we have exceeded our time limit. And uh, thank you, uh, to do, a special thanks to Dr. Watkin and to all of our speakers um, for such amazing and wonderful presentation and uh, excellent um, interaction by all of our experts. Thank you so much to uh, the Transalumna people for organizing this program. Thank you so much and over to the organizers. Thank you so much everyone for joining today's event. Thank you. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Wonderful interaction.